call this meeting to order. This is April 13th, 2023, meeting of Jefferson City Planning and Zoning Commission. My name is Dale Vaughn. I'm the chair of the commission. I would like to remind commission members to turn on their microphones when speaking and ask everyone present to please silence their phones and any other electronics during the meeting. We will go ahead and have members introduce themselves, starting with council liaison. Mike Lester, council liaison. Sarah Michael, alternate. Randy Hoselton, alternate. Hank Vogt. Bunny Tricky Cotton. Penny Quigg, vice chair. Shannon Hawk. Emily Frothawk. Jacob Robinette. Trika Young. Tom Wardenhouse. Queen of Bliss City Planner. Eric Baring, planning manager. Clint Smith, Director of uh, Planning and Protective Services, and uh, I've been on the job for about eight days, so I will I'll learn the on and off button. So, <laughs> Shane Wade, Public Works. Dustin Birch, Associate City Attorney. Lisa Dittmer, Administrative Assistant. Thank you. The City Code authorizes nine regular members and three alternates. Alternates are designated to vote upon the absence or disqualification of regular members. A quorum of five members or alternates is necessary to conduct business. I declare that a quorum is present. The, uh, we do have one member that is absent this evening, that's Greg Butler. Um, are there any members who are disqualified from voting on any agenda item? See none. The voting members are as follows. Bunny Tricky Cotton, Emily Fretwell, Shannon Hawk, Penny Quigg, Jacob Robinette, Trika Young, Hank Vogt, Tom Waterhouse, and Randy Holston. Oh, excuse me, Holston is an alternate. Uh, is someone in attendance to? So, what? Oh, no, just to clarify, oh. yeah, yeah, it's all regular members and then one alternate, the senior alternate, uh, Mr. Wardenhausen, is eligible okay. to vote, so. Okay, and we do have a member that is leaving, Jacob Robinette is leaving at some point in time, but we'll. And so the alternates can participate in discussion, but uh, are not not voting members uh, up until you know if someone leaves, then we reestablish the voting. Is someone in attendance to present this case number P two three zero zero five twenty seven thirty eight Rock Ridge Road? Yep. Yep. Okay. Is someone in attendance to present the case number P two three zero zero? Or excuse me. 23010810 El Dorado Drive. Case number P23011, 2900 block of Route CC. Case P23012, temporary signage. Yeah, so that case was uh, initiated actually through the Public Works and Planning Subcommittee of the City Council, and Mr. Matt Kreiling, um, gotcha. is without a microphone, uh, is here to uh, <laughs> present that one. And then last case, P23013, 2700 East McCarty Street. Paul Sampson. Are there any requests for continuance? We haven't received any requests for continuance. Okay. Are there any, uh, I guess we have reordered the agenda, correct? No, we have not. Okay. The agenda so we reordered part of this in, a, in good order. So. Okay. Courtney, will you please read the format of the hearing in order of testimony? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to br briefly describe the procedures of the commission. The proceedings of the meeting are being recorded, so please step to the microphone when you speak and give your name and address for the record. The standard order of each case is as follows. After introduction of the request by city staff, the applicant or their consultant will provide information on the request. The opening presentation by the applicant shall be limited to 10 minutes, unless additional time is granted by the commission. The applicant shall have an additional three minutes for closing testimony if requested. We will then ask to hear from supporters of the request. We will then ask to hear from opponents of the request. We will then ask to hear from anyone else who wishes to speak on the request. Testimony shall be limited to three minutes each unless additional time is granted by the commission. City staff will then give the recommendations on the request. In order to reduce the time necessary to hear an application, references to printed materials including staff reports and applicable findings shall not be read into the record unless directed by the commission. The Commission will close testimony from the floor. The Commission will discuss the proposal, then publicly make its determination with reasons. 
The form of motion shall be positive, that is that the motion shall be made to accept the request as presented or with modifications, stipulations, or conditions. A final vote will be taken with ayes in favor, nays opposed. The chair shall announce the results of the vote, specifying the number of votes cast in favor and the number of votes cast against. The following documents are entered as exhibits for all items under consideration at this meeting. The City Code of City of Jefferson as amended, the Comprehensive Plan and Land Use Map, copies of applications under consideration, a list of property owners to whom notices were sent, the affidavit of publication of the public notice in the newspaper, copies of drawings, plans, and or renderings under consideration, letters from member and of staff, staff reports, minutes of proceedings, correspondence or other materials submitted by the public or the applicant, rules of procedure for the Jefferson City Planning and Zoning Commission. These items are public record and available for inspection through the Department of Planning and Protective Services or through the Office of the City Clerk. Please be advised that any items that are presented, distributed, or otherwise received pertaining to the cases under consideration become the property of the Commission. This includes any photographs, drawings, petitions, and letters. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Courtney. Can I have a uh, motion to adopt the, gen the agenda as printed? So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. Motion carries. Can I have a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of March 9th, 2023? So moved. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. Motion carries. So we've received, previously we, the commissioners have, our commission members have received correspondence on 2738 Rock Ridge Road, but we do have some new correspondence that just showed up tonight, um, and it's on the case number P230101. 810 El Dorado Drive. So I'm going to give you guys a second to go go through that. If anybody needs to go through that, let me know. We'll go ahead and let uh, anybody else that needs to continue to read that to read it as we go. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to the case number P230052738 Rock Ridge Road. Courtney, could you please present the case? Actually, I'll, I'll oh. present this one. Okay. So, thank you, Mr. Chair. No and so as read, uh, the property is located at 2738 Rock Ridge Road. So up on the screen is a location map. Uh, on top of the zoning map for the area. So I'll point out a, a few things. Currently, the property is zoned in RS2, a single family residential zoning district. Uh, there is one single family house located on the property. 
Um, it consists of a couple different parcels, so there's a small parcel line uh, located right there, um, but you know, for the purposes of the request, it can basically be considered a, a single tract. Uh, it is located uh, basically right beside the city limit boundary, you know, toward the western edge of the city. And so this orange line right here is the city limit boundary. And as you can see, the zoning map uh, you know, does not, uh, there are no zoning districts on the other side of the line. Uh, there is no zoning in unincorporated Cole County. And so to the north of the property uh, is a couple single family homes as well as a private drive called Northwood Drive. Um, and with several single family homes located on it and some commercial zoning uh, further up Rock Ridge Road. To the west of the property, or sorry, to the east of the property is the interchange of Highway 179 and uh, Missouri Route C. So Missouri Route C is the highway you know, going through the middle of the screen right here. And so it does border the property on the south, uh, Route C does. And then on the east, uh, the property borders the, uh, the off-ramp uh, for Missouri Highway 179. So uh, there's a stoplight interchange uh, located at this intersection right here, the off-ramp in Route C. Also a stoplight interchange located right here where Rock Ridge Road and Route C intersect. And then to the south, uh, the, the road name is Route CC. So it's Missouri Route CC, double-lettered route uh, with stoplight interchange. And then on the north, uh, there is a, a stub of Southridge Drive. Uh, before the highway was constructed, Southridge, Southridge Drive you know, continued on uh, through here. And uh, um, as you can see, Southridge Drive on the other side of the highway up here, but with the highway, it cut that road, and so that is a, essentially a dead-end stub. And this property was annexed uh, into the city of Jefferson in 2008 as part of the, as a voter-approved Route C Capitol Hills annexation area, meaning that this was an annexation area that was proposed and uh, put on the ballot and, and voted on by the people and ultimately approved. And so the, the zoning for the area was applied at that time, essentially. Um, you know, there's been a, a few rezoning actions, uh, uh, you know, nothing, I don't think, in, in this particular area, uh, but some to the, to the south just off the screen. And so, uh, well, I'll continue back here. And so the, the request um, is to rezone the property from its designation of, of RS2, single family residential, to a C2, a general commercial zoning designation. And so the request is, is put forward by Glenwood Equities, LLC. Um, the application is signed by the current property owner uh, of the property, but it's Glenwood Equities that is, is uh, essentially here to, to represent this particular request. So in addition to the rezoning request, uh, it's also paired up with an amendment to the, the, the future land use map of the comprehensive plan. Uh, as you're aware, uh, the t zoning decisions are essentially based on certain criteria within the zoning code, but then also uh, conformance with the future land use map of the, of the comprehensive plan. So that's what this screen is representing is that future land use map. Uh, and so that map is contained in the comprehensive plan and continues beyond the city limit boundary. And uh, as you can see, the, the property highlighted here is currently shown on that map as, uh, as a low density residential designation. And I'll touch on that a little bit more um, uh, here toward the end of, of my overview. And so the stated purpose for this rezoning request is to, uh, to uh, acquire the property and construct a 10,000 square foot retail building. And so uh, here's a, a visual showing uh, the kind of the topography of the property. Um, and, uh, and also some other site features essentially taken off of our online GIS system. Um, I will point out that toward the southern side of the property, uh, there is a uh, gas underground pipeline, gas pipeline. Uh, and so a pretty major pipeline that traverses the entire city, um, you know, literally from, from the east side to, to the west. And, uh, and so they're well aware of the presence of that pipeline and uh, some of the easement is contained on the property. So with the application materials, they have submitted a, uh, a site plan. And so uh, I'll reference that this site plan is, a, is conceptual in nature. And so it's, it's not meant to be a final design or represented as such. It's basically just a, a, an overview of what uh, you know, to show what they, they would, would likely be constructing on the building and how that generally would lay on the property. 
Um, I'll point out that uh, site plans and you know the future construction plans for a property are not required as part of a rezoning application. And so, um, you know, they, they, you know, the, the, the application to rezone the property and the criteria that, that's really looked at here is to, to determine whether a commercial zoning of the property is appropriate. Um, but the site plan is somewhat useful in envisioning what could be constructed on the property and also how in describing how, you know, other city development standards would apply uh, to this particular property and, and this layout. So I'll touch on some of those development standards. Again, these are standards that are contained in, in the city code, and so in the zoning code and other chapters of the city code that, that deal with, uh, with new construction and new commercial construction in Jefferson City. And so the zoning code contains a, a lot of different development standards, so I'll just touch on a few. There are setback standards. I think those are, are some of the most, uh, you know, um, well known that you know buildings new buildings when they're located on a property are required to be set back a certain distance from property lines based on the different zoning you know designations a c2 general commercial zoning district has kind of standard setbacks of 25 feet on the front and 20 on the rear uh, there are buffer yard standards and so standards where when commercial buildings you know and, or commercial uses are being located next to residentially zoned property that there's certain you know screening or separation requirements in order to you know to mitigate you know kind of the the presence or the the impact on surrounding property uh, sometimes these can consist of a, like a solid fence with a row of trees uh, sometimes they can consist of natural areas where existing trees are left in place and sometimes those requirements are met by by um, you know, by the by, larger separation distance. So basically, a larger setback from the property line. Now, the city does have standards re you know, requiring parking lot landscaping trees. So you'll note this drawing doesn't show any parking lot landscaping trees on it, but that would be a requirement as you you look at new development around the city. You'll see that trees are located in the parking lots. Uh, that is because they are required by the zoning code. And also, the zoning code has parking lot lighting standards, and so that's a, a concern that's often received. You know, sometimes in you know in uh, matters that appear in front of the planning and zoning commission about bright lights, and so there are lighting standards that are contained within the zoning code uh, that that um, you know prevent you know that maximum lighting standards based on the the foot candle or kind of the 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 amount of lighting that is is hitting the ground. The city has uh, stormwater regulations, and those kind of come in two parts, stormwater quality and stormwater quantity. Uh, usually quantity is a, is a, you know, is a larger concern, uh, and, uh, uh, and those requirements have been around longer. And so the general, uh, general concept there is that a new development you know, has to accommodate the extra stormwater that's being created by the impervious surface. That's, that would be placed on it. So, you know, new buildings and new parking lots, you know, would be designed, you know, required to be designed, you know, in order to accommodate that stormwater. And so um, those types of reviews are typically done by our public works department, our engineers, stormwater engineers who, who are trained uh, in, in uh, 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 you know, interpreting and, and uh, administering those regulations. And... Uh, and then the city also has uh, stormwater quality regulations. So those are a little bit newer, more of an environmental nature in, in design that you know, when, uh, when water flows off of uh, parking lots and other things that's expected to have pollutants in it, that, you know, that first flush of water is being treated in some way is kind of a, a brief way to describe that. And so a lot of the comments that have been received on this case, as you can you know, read through the, the packets, some of those might be addressed by some of these standards. Um, and so there's, there's one remaining that, that has been, uh, I think, referenced uh, fairly heavily within the, the correspondence as traffic. And so, and so the zoning code does have a uh, you know, requirement for what's called a traffic impact analysis. But it's, it's triggered for when new uses that are expected to generate more than 100 peak hour vehicle trips. So a peak hour vehicle trip is like basically the rush hour vehicles. Um, whenever uh, rush hour is occurring on the street adjacent to a new development, the primary concern is how many new cars are being placed on that street by this development. And if the answer is 100 peak hour vehicle trips or more, then that triggers a requirement for a traffic impact analysis. 
Now, what that does not do, it's, it doesn't prevent a development from occurring. Really, the purpose of a traffic impact analysis is to determine what improvements would be necessary and to be constructed along with the development in order to accommodate the additional traffic. Uh, for example, a very large shopping center that's being constructed might be required to put in a stoplight of some order, you know, and you know, with a certain number of lanes. So those studies are undertaken by uh, professional engineers, you know, traffic engineers, and uh, you know, some is to the city for review, and uh, you know, if necessary, would would be tacked onto a development plan. However, this particular you know development, what uh, what they've referenced within their application materials, a ten thousand square foot uh, retail building, would not be expected to to uh, approach one hundred peak hour you know additional vehicle trips, and so would not you know would not be triggering that requirement for a site specific traffic impact analysis. Now that being said. Uh, city staff still look at you know new driveway connections and new developments, you know from that traffic perspective. So it's primarily the engineering staff that review the driveway and traffic circulation for all new developments in the city. And you know some of these things include you know making sure that the site distance for new driveways are appropriate based on the travel speed of the adjacent roadway. And also, you know, making sure that the driveways are constructed uh, in accordance with the, uh, you know, uh, the standard driveway designs for whatever use it is that's being being proposed on the property. For example, if a, you know, if it's a commercial use, there's there's certain standard designs for commercial driveway connections to the road. Now, Rockridge Road at this location is partially MoDOT right of way, and so. Uh, at some point, you know, in between uh, Route C and, and Rockridge, there, there's the boundary line where, where it stops becoming MoDOT right-of-way and, and becomes, uh, in effect, city right-of-way as it's located within the incorporated limits of the city of Jefferson. And so, um, if a driveway connection is located on MoDOT right-of-way, then it would actually be MoDOT staff that would, would have the lead role in that review um, of a new driveway connection and making sure you know, it's meeting the, their standards. And so they, they review those things. Uh, again, they operate under the, the you know, engineering standards that they review such things for. And so I hope that gives a, you know, kind of an overview that um, you know, traffic for new, new developments, that there are, there are certain thresholds and you know, things that are contained within the city code, plus uh, it's, a, it's an item that city staff look at for all new developments uh, across the city. So I'll uh, let's see. I do have a couple visuals here um, of the of the property, and so this one is taken from the intersection of Rockridge Road and Route C, and then you know just to the to the right hand side off the screen would would be Route CC, you know going south of Route C, and so uh, it is a stoplight interchange. You can see stoplights, um, and so the property is the essentially the wooded area back there. You can see kind of the cleared out area right here, uh, which is the location of the underground uh, gas pipeline. Um, they uh, fairly recently, just a couple of years ago, did a, a major kind of uh, rehab project uh, across the entire city. And so, you know, some of that work shows up in, in a lot of the aerial photography and, you know, and uh, they, they were there for quite a while. <laughs> And then another image, and this image is from the uh, the intersection of the on ramp and off ramp uh, for Highway 179 and Missouri Route C. Again, stoplight interchange there, and then the the property is is essentially the wooded area located there. And so you can see there's a, a bit of a, a bluff there uh, heading toward the off ramp. And so within the 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 packets that have been presented to you uh, and sent out uh, last week. Uh, there, there are responses to the required criteria, uh, the criteria that would be looked at for a rezoning. Again, the criteria that's contained within the zoning code uh, for rezoning proposals. And then also responses to those same criteria for comprehensive plan amendments. And so those, there's responses within the application materials on both of those items, and then responses within the staff reports on uh, staff report on on both of those items. And so the staff comments are largely based, uh, you know, for this particular proposal, largely based on the the high traffic nature of this interchange, and uh, relatively easy access uh, to the property by the traveling public. 
Um, regarding the comprehensive plan amendment, uh, there's an item that's that's referenced within the, the report materials, and that is uh, the annexation plan of intent. And so back in 2008, whenever the annexation of the Route C Capitol Hills annexation area was being proposed to the voters, uh, it is you know, standard kind of a requirement when such proposals are being presented to have what's called an annexation plan of intent. And that includes essentially how the city is going to be providing municipal services for the annexed area. It includes all sorts of uh, uh, information on how police service, fire service, and you know, street service, et cetera, are going to, to be you know, provided to the area. And so one item that's contained within that is uh, essentially the zoning and, and the land use. Um, and so within the text of that annexation plan of intent, uh, it was uh, referenced um, that you know that the interchange, the interchange of Highway 179 and Route C, you know, is well suited for commercial development. So that's something that I need to point out to you that that was a reference within that annexation plan of intent. However, whenever it came time to to actually lay out the uh, the future land use map of the comprehensive plan, essentially that map. Um, which is shown right here, mirrors the zoning map that was applied. So there wasn't a future land use map contained within that, that annexation plan. It was just a zoning map. And so the future land use map at the time mirrors the zoning for the property, despite there being references within the text of the plan of the suitability for commercial development of that interchange. And so, and so, I hope that that gives some of the some of the background on uh, at least the staff responses uh, to the review criteria. Um, with that, I'm happy to answer any initial questions. Uh, the applicant is here, and you know can hopefully shed some, you know, or you know have information and in, uh, behind some of the purpose of the request, and uh, answer any questions as well. <clears throat> so, as far as the buffer goes, it, what's the? Um, you said it could be either trees or a fence or things like that. Um, what's what happens if trees are planted but they die later on? Are they? If that happens, is what, what's the city's plan to, to make sure that that's and so they are required to maintain them over time, and so we do we do occasionally have to um, you know have to issue uh, what in effect are you know, kind of violation notices that the the trees need to be reestablished, okay. and that's that's you know far more common in parking lot landscaping. Um, uh, but it applies to, to buffer yards and uh, PUD scenarios as well. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. On the uh, review criteria, it says the, an on-site sewer service is likely on the property. Could you just explain what? Yes, thank you. And so uh, the property, I, you know, their plan, I believe, is to is to serve you know the future development with an on-site system. And so on their their conceptual site plan, uh, they actually show show that uh, kind of in the fine print, but a, a septic field. And so and so the reasoning behind that is uh, they're located a very far away, very far away from uh, municipal sewer lines. And so you know, up on the screen, I'll, I'll tell you that. The sewer lines are shown. <laughs> there are none, um, and so I believe, uh, by my measurement, uh, a sewer line extension of something on the order of 1,500 feet would be necessary to to serve this property. And so um, it is an option to to have an on-site system. Uh, that that is an option for development. And there there are some you know developments and many homes uh, within Jeff City that you know that are that are on on-site systems. And so. They, uh, they'd be required to uh, design it and have it approved and permitted. Um, uh, my understanding is through the Department of Health. And so if they are able to uh, achieve that approval and get that permit, then yes, an on-site system is an option. So. Do any other commissioners have any questions for staff? Go ahead, Penny. When I went out to visit the site, um, there were two like I guess utility markers there were two round ones and I assumed one of those referenced the pipeline do you know what the other one was were they real close right beside each other yes okay. so the pipeline is actually three pipelines I believe located just right beside each other and that might be uh, if I recall is if I see those markings around town they come in in chunks of three 
So that might be it. I, there was enough traffic that I could <laughs> slow down to read what the sign said, but yeah. so I appreciate that. Thank you, Eric. Anybody else have any questions for staff? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we will now uh, hear from persons who would like to present this case. Please come forward to the microphone and give your name and address for the record. Yeah, step on up. <laughs> just uh, whenever you get up here, just give us your name and address. My name is Bob Elkin, and uh, I'll introduce myself as part of Glenwood Equities, headquartered at uh, 1415 Elbridge Drive, Chesterfield, Missouri. For those that are familiar with Chesterfield, we're right at, across the street from the mall. So thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission for having us come up here and uh, being part of your uh, presentation. Eric, I'd like to thank you for stealing 10 or 15 minutes of of my discussion, which is just fine with me. You did a wonderful job. Uh, to add what Eric presented, uh, it's obviously a phenomenal location for any general business. If we look at the zoning maps, we're surrounded to the northwest with commercial, to the south with commercial. We're wedged right in between. There are traffic lights that create phenomenal access for a commercial type business. Uh, a retailer, whether it's a Dollar General, whether it's a Walgreen, a CVS drug, they really are not creating additional traffic to any area. They're taking what's already there and bringing it off of sea into that particular location, that business. And I think that's an important point because everyone thinks that when a retail structure is built, so much more traffic is coming to the table. That's not the case. Uh, that's, if the traffic is already there, and I think we can all agree it is there. Uh, we just came from the site. It's with what we're building, and what we're building is a 10,640 square foot Dollar General. Uh, we just came from one of our newest stores that we built in St. Martin. And for those of you that uh, have seen the St. Martin, this, that's a 9,100 foot building. This is 10,640 to accommodate the additional traffic and the additional population. The grades on this particular site are set right now based on our most current survey uh, to, to the Far north, I forgot the name of the street, South, south Ridge, we're at 795 feet. That isn't going to change. We're grading down to 780 feet. There's a lot of brush. There's a lot of trees. Uh, the subject of fences, uh, landscaping came along. We're open to all of them with, uh, to work with staff anyway. Uh, we can. Uh, the people on Southridge aren't even going to see this building. It's going to be far below their 795 feet. Our plans, our civil engineering plans, our architectural plans were, were submitted both to uh, the city, Jefferson City, our engineering plans have been reviewed extensively by Missouri Department of Transportation. They were approved. Our turning radiuses meet all acceptable uh, access for 
tractor trailer delivery, which isn't all that often. And it's typically at timing that does not disrupt any body coming and going. It's typically in the morning, early morning. That's when they like to stock. Uh, it's an attractive building. It's if every time I come to a public hearing, somebody will point out that, well, there's a store two miles from there that's falling apart or whatever. Well, typically what is happening is Dollar General years ago adopted a similar plan that Walgreens and CVS did. They're coming out of those shopping centers and they're building freestanding buildings in on parcels of land like this. Those, that's the dinosaur era in retailing. Walgreens did it, CVS did it, we're doing it. Uh, the grocers are doing it in a lot of a lot of locations, and we're no different. Uh, we're open to any and all questions. Uh, uh, the item of uh, sanitary sewer came up. He's correct. Uh, the sewer is somewhere between twelve and fifteen hundred feet away. It's uh, not possible at this time for us to tie into it. We do have the latest uh, system designed for this, and I'm going to call on David Elkin to tell you something about that system. It doesn't affect anybody in any way. It doesn't create any odor in any way. It's Go, go ahead. I'll let you. Sure. David Elkin with Glenwood Equities. Uh, in in short, it's a. Um, and what's your What's your address? Oh, uh, one four one five Albert Payne Road, Chesterfield, Missouri. Uh, the the septic is is not your standard uh, drain filter. It's more like a drip system or a sand filter. Uh, depending on the design, it, it most probably will be underground. So. Thank you. If you notice on the site plan that you, I believe you have in front of you, um, the detention basin is on the far east end of the property, away from everybody and everything. And the building will be seen from Highway C. And I believe that's it because if you cross Rock Ridge Road, you're at seven, seven I wanna say 779. Uh, on the topographical survey. I think that's right. I might be off by a few feet. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions that anybody has. I'm not new to this. Uh, I'm, for many, many years, I sat on your side of the aisle as chairman of a Planning and Zoning Commission for well over 10 years, and we've heard every possible item that anybody could ever dream of hearing. So we're happy to answer the citizens' questions and hopefully gain their acceptance uh, with any matters that they may uh, present. Thank you again. I do have just one question. Sure. What did you say the height difference was from the very top to the parking lot? 795 on the top. And our finished floor is 780. So 10 feet, basically. Is that right? Uh, 15, 15 feet. feet. Sorry. 15 feet to the floor. Hmm. So, the, yeah. so, so the the that will not be a retaining wall. That will be a sloped um behind it yeah um, those are the dark outlined lines are retaining walls along 179 on the far right yes so basically okay. you'll be lowering it but also raising it to level out. you're Correct. basically grading a hill and then pushing yeah. the yeah those are huge retaining walls by the way so they are re, like a straight up and down retaining wall yes okay same thing in the back the rear 
Uh, or is that a? No, on the far right, right there, that's, that's a full retaining wall. Got it. In the back, along South Ridge, uh, we're not sure how much of the uh, vegetation will remain, as it's very heavy right now. Uh, and and, and the how only much we might have to replace right. our fence. Right. Uh, the only reason I ask that question is it may, you know, if it was level with everything else, it would, it may, you know, the fact that it's lower would have less impact on lighting, as far as lighting goes. Correct. So that's, so that's the reason why I asked that and, question. But and by the way, I meant to bring that up. I left some of my notes in the in my office, but uh, the lighting is LED. It's faced in. It doesn't shine into anybody's neighbor neighborhood. Uh, it's strictly f faced into the parking lot. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, I think we're good. Thank, Thank you, you again. Is there anyone else here that would like to um, present this case? Uh, well, present? Against. Uh, okay, we'll get to you. Hold on one second. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to, um, is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this case? See none. Uh, so what I want to do real quick is I want to get a kind of a show of hands of people who would like to speak in opposition, just a show of hands to see how many people we have. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to allow anybody that would like to speak in opposition, but we're, we're because you know we only have so much time for to get all these cases through. We want to hear everybody's opposition, but we also want to keep it limited uh, to three minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to set a timer for each person that comes up. You'll come up, state your name and address, and then um, speak. Uh, you know, for up to three minutes. We'll try to give you as much time as possible to get the point across. So we'll go ahead and start that. Um, is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition? If you want to come up, uh, can you can you can you come to the podium? I was going to say, I'm okay. Handicapped. Can I just sit here? Boy, can I project? So the only reason we would ask you to speak in the microphone is so that people that watch these meetings, um, yeah, yeah. I'll say in the yeah. past we've allowed the microphone. No, for, that's totally fine. That would, and that's that's why I'm just saying instead of just, we yeah. need you to speak in the microphone so we can. Keep My name is Thomas Bartlett. And I own 2807 Rock Ridge Road, and I have owned it since 1974. And I want to thank the young man that just handed me the microphone. You did a great job. Uh, in answer to the gentleman that was just up there, and we'll make it quick, uh, I disagree with a lot of points he said. If you look from down at the intersection of uh, Rock Ridge and C, when you head up towards Rock Ridge, there's a curve. Okay, so if you come out of Southridge Court, which was not mentioned, uh, it's a kind of a blind place to start with. And some of my neighbors have had near wrecks because people like to come down that road about 45 or 50 miles an hour instead of what they should be. And there's a lot of traffic on that road. If I had one of those counters with a rubber hose and they were going across, I'd be willing to bet there's more than 100 cars a day easy on that road. Okay, so you have a letter from me, by the way. Uh, so I'm just going to read it real quick, not to insult your intelligence. Too much local traffic generated. Excessive vehicular noise. You got all these diesel trucks and they'd like to come up that hill. I can hear that through my, over my television. Excessive local illumination, too many bright lights. Here's a big one. Unsafe line of sight entering and exiting proposed business. Because you got to cut both ways. You don't have a lot of time to pull out. Okay. Another one. Safety traffic concerns for local residents, i.e. Southridge Court and 2807 Rock Ridge Drive. Rock Ridge Road, which is a private drive. That's my drive. This also includes South Ridge Road, directly behind proposed business. This proposed business is too close to the intersection of Route C and Rock Ridge Road. 
Final paragraph. There's already too much traffic noise on Rock Ridge Road now. It'll only get worse with the opening of a commercial business at the intersection of Route C and Rock Ridge Road. Your consideration of these points is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. You got any questions for me? Um, yes, uh, so we'll probably, unless anybody else needs the microphone, we'll have you come up and stand up in the podium if that's okay, yep. Does anybody have any questions for the gentleman that just spoke? Okay, go ahead. Name yeah. and address. Sure, uh, Dennis Lachek, 2773 Southridge, Southridge Court. And I actually uh, live on that Southridge Court right there where that big bend is. And to reiterate Tom's, um, you know, his concern is mine is the liability as well. Um, it's, a, it, it's a very big um, obstruction of view. I've, I've been hit there. My son has been hit there. And there's a lot of, been, a lot of other close encounters as well. So, I mean, on a liability standpoint, um, doesn't matter if it's Dollar General or whatever business goes in there there's going to be some type of li liability. Um, and, and so just to be short and sweet, that, that's the concern that I want to kind of um, address. So thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Dennis? No. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Whoever else would like to come up and speak in opposition? Good evening, Mr. Chair. And Commissioners, city staff, my name is Randall Wright. I live at 1800 Northwood Drive. I want to enter into the record the petition letter of opposition to this proposal signed by 24 residents and also confirm that each of you did receive a copy of that. Okay. I want to reiterate some of the primary objections um, to this proposed change in zoning and to the business uh, that is proposed for the site. The subject site for this proposed business is problematic for many reasons. Um, um, additional members of the neighborhood are going to provide um, you know, more, more uh, testimony with regard to this, but we've also detailed that in our petition letter, so I won't go into all of those. Uh, the most important objection I want to emphasize is the safety of all the adults and children in the neighborhood. Uh, we have a daycare um, that's located on Southridge Court that was just mentioned. Um, we've got so we've got a school bus stop right there at South Ridge Court. Um, as it was mentioned, it's a, it's a blind curve. We've got a 40 mile an hour uh, speed limit on Rock Ridge, and people come flying around there, uh, and you know have to slam on their brakes. I mean, for any kind of traffic that might be trying to enter Rock Ridge right there uh, in the morning time and during rush hours, it's just exacerbated and and, and, and gets even worse. Uh, the road infrastructure is completely inadequate to handle the additional traffic desiring to access this site. With only one ingress, ingress and egress to the subject property, uh, combined with the lack of existing road infrastructure, this proposal is a recipe for personal injury and possible fatality, as was mentioned before. Um, back to the city's staff comment about the, the traffic study. Um, I would, you know, personally uh, believe that a traffic study should be conducted and, and request that, that one be conducted uh, before approving this. The second major objection I want to make is a very real potential for criminal activity. Um, other members of the neighborhood have documented crime statistics they're going to be bringing forth. The third objection is the lack of public sewer. That's been discussed as well. Um, I did a quick measurement on the GIS uh, today, and, and there is a, a city connection point adjacent to my property down in the valley there, a manhole, um, and, I, and from that connection point to the edge of this site, I measured 975 feet, so I challenge the fact that it's not possible or feasible to extend the city sewer. Um, and to that same point, uh, in 2020, the city staff wrote letters to residents in the neighborhood proposing to extend the public sewer to the residents in the area. So therefore, it's been contemplated by the city and the city engineers. Uh, it certainly is possible with that manhole um, to make a connection, you know, and right around 1,000 feet for the city sewer. Randy, uh, we're 
past three minutes, so if you want to. Okay, all right. Um, the, the main thing is, you know, I just want to implore the commission, uh, each commissioner, to consider their, the objections brought forth today and pray that you will carefully consider your vote in light of the residents' wishes that have been expressed to you. I urge you to vote no on this rezoning request. Thank you for your time. Do you have any questions? Any questions for Andy? No. Thank you. All right. Would the, if anybody else would like to speak in opposition of this, please give your name and address. Hello. I'm Marvin Hawkins, and I live at 2830 Rock Ridge Road, which is just uh, right up around, uh, it's slightly uphill off of Route C, up around the curve, and I live on the right side. And uh, my thing is, um, the gentleman said that uh, they were looking for uh, the motoring public off of Route C. They've got to get on Ro Rock Ridge Road to access this uh, property. So they're, they're, uh, they can't access it off of Route C. And so, and I'm just saying there's enough uh, traffic already. Because uh, I, I drive that every day. Because I I'm live right there closed about five properties uh, uh, north of um, the proposed site. And, um, and I, I come in and out all times of the day. And I, I see traffic uh, stacked up. Um, uh, quite a quite a ways uh, back at the uh, uh, traffic light uh, there on Rock Ridge. So I just wanted to um, uh, just say that. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you, sir. Any questions for Marvin? Thank you. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Karen Lukanoff, and I live at 2761 South Ridge Court. I am the daycare center owner up there on South Ridge Court, and my concern with Rock Ridge Road property being zoned as commercial is the safety of the daycare parents and children in order to get to my residence. Uh, on a weekly basis, my parents complain that they must wait to turn left onto Southridge Court from Rock Ridge because traffic at the stoplight is backed up to Southridge Court. The other concern is that when they leave Southridge Court, there is a blind curve to the north that obstructs their view. Many times vehicles leaving Southridge Court are pulling out in front of other vehicles on Rock Ridge because they cannot see around the blind curve. This curve also is a huge problem for students from the daycare that catch a school bus. The vehicles are coming around the corner at a high rate of speed, which can cause for safety concern. I have talked with first student transportation many times to get the route changed so daycare children don't have to cross Rock Ridge to enter the bus. Another safety concern is that the parking lot will be a direct view of my backyard. This will allow anyone to sit on the parking lot and have full visibility into my backyard where my daycare children play. Lastly, with a business like Dollar General or any business coming into the neighborhood, I will need to prepare my children for potential safety issues such as gunshot or crime, armed robberies or domestic disputes. I would encourage anyone on this board to come out and experience this intersection for themselves. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, any does questions? anybody have any, cu any questions? questions? Karen. We have a child care crisis in our community and in our state as a whole. So I just wanted to take a moment to thank you for what you're doing and, and thank you for uh, providing those services in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. 
My name is uh, Deborah Schulenberg. My husband Melvin and I live at 2765 Southridge Court and have been residents of Southridge Court for over 50 years. In our time here, we have seen and embraced many changes. For most of these changes have been very positive to our community. One change that will not be positive is the zoning the property on Rockridge to as commercial. Rockridge Road is a two-lane road with no shoulders, no turning lanes. The posted speed limit on this road is 40 miles per hour. But most vehicles regularly travel well over that. The common theme that you will hear many times tonight is the blind corner on Southridge Court. This is a very dangerous intersection and there have been many near misses. Adding dollar general traffic into Rockridge Road will only make this intersection more dangerous. We feel like the septic system will not be adequate for this type of business and should be ma mandated to go on to just city sanitary system as any new business or home in the city would be required to do. The business that we currently have in this area blend into the surroundings and don't have any intrusive lights that stay on all the time. With the Dollar General, their exterior lights and signage will be on 24 hours a day causing light pollution in our neighborhood. Not only the early morning deliveries, when they say no traffic is there, how early? One, two, three o'clock in the morning? The proposed site for the store is on an unlevel rock bluff, which will require blasting or chipping to bring the property to grade. Chipping in an area this size will be long and a noisy process. Blasting over a period of time could increase property damage to our homes, even when the blast is deemed to be within the limits. And we experience this with St. Mary's Hospital and 179 for damage for foundation, roofs. Um, the last concern I would like to address is the crime. With Jeff City Police Department short staff, what is the plan for routine patrolling that will respond time, what will respond times be should property uh, the robbery, domestic dispute happen at this location. Uh, thank you for listening to our concerns. Are there any questions? Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Quick and to the point. <clears throat> Is there anyone else that would like to speak in opposition? Hello, my name is Jenny Lang. I'm here with my husband, Kevin. We have two children and we live at 2757 South Ridge Court. I have lived in this house for 43 years. My husband and I bought this house for my parents 23 years ago. Tonight you have heard a lot about the dangerous corner on South Ridge Court. This corner has been blasted probably 30 years ago to, it used to be worse, but it's still a definite problem for our neighborhood. But I would like to let you guys know of the area that we live in. Majority of the homes on these streets are generational homes. They're farmlands. We have tractors that drive up and down Rockridge all the time. So that is not something that is uncommon for us to see. At our house, in a three mile radius, we have everything we need. We have a grocery store locally owned. We have convenience stores, banks, restaurants, churches, hotels, and any other businesses that we would need. The businesses with, for instance, the Green Horizon, Stockman, further down the street, all of those businesses fit into the community. There's no lights on at during the night, you would never know that those businesses exist unless you're there during the daytime. So this is a very middle class family. We all have kids, our kids play in the street, they ride their bikes. With a Dollar General coming in, the average crime for a Dollar General in Jefferson City according to the Jeff City Police Department, so out of eight locations, there is a 911 call to every location every 10 days. So the Dollar General that the gentleman was talking about in St. Martin's has had 55 incidences in the last two years to that Dollar General of a 911 call, so an officer physically going out there to that business. So um, the other thing that I would like to mention is in 2022, May of 2022, 
There was a fight in Columbia, Missouri for a Dollar General in a very similar area that we are dealing with to, at this time. And in September of 2022, the council denied this request for the safety of the neighborhood and the patrons of the community. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Ginny? No, thank you. Sure, anyone else in the opposition? My name is Randy Ford, and I live at 1605 Foxmore Court. I do not live on Rock Ridge. I live on the other side of Rock Ridge, but I have to deal with the intersection multiple times a day. And I know that people have talked about traffic and safety, but that intersection, trying to come off Rock Ridge, or on my side, on Route CC, many times through the day is terrible. The lights don't switch based on the traffic sitting there. I've sat there many times up to five minutes waiting to cross onto Rock Ridge, get onto Route C, et cetera. So, you know, safety is an issue. Plus tonight, you've got another item on your agenda for a subdivision proposal. And I think that has 29 lots proposed to that, two vehicles per lot. That's another 60 vehicles potential twice a day that are gonna to have to come through that same intersection and is going to impact that intersection even more. And one thing, and I think Eric did a fine job that was not mentioned, Rock Ridge is part of the city's bike loop. So now you're adding bicycles to that area also. Safety. Thank you. Any questions about anything? Any questions for Randy? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else in the audience that would like to speak in opposition? Sure. Hi, my name is Shauna Pooler. I live at 1815 Norbert, so I'm the road up from the pr proposed. And I just want to say that um, Rock Ridge, for one, is a crumbling road that barely maintains the traffic that's already on it. I have sat, when I come off out of my private drive, sat for at least 10 to 15 minutes waiting on traffic going both ways to get out of my road in the mornings to go to work. And there, then when I get onto the road, I'm sitting there in traffic. I may sit through the light four times before I ever get down there. The school bus is usually in front of me children are coming through and like I said there's that blind corner and it's not it's very dangerous and to have another Dollar General in a residential quiet middle class residential area I don't feel is necessary we can go five minutes down Jefferson Dollar General we can go five minutes down Highway 54 Dollar General or we can go over onto the Boulevard Dollar General by the way criminal statistics at the Boulevard Missouri Boulevard Dollar General 96 calls last year, 96 times the police were there on the Missouri Boulevard in a high, you know, trafficked area. And the one on Jefferson, I wouldn't go in there because I'd probably get mugged before I ever got through the doors. And I just don't feel as I'm a single woman by myself and the lady next to me is 90 years old, lives by herself. I don't feel comfortable having a business come in that attracts a crowd of of criminal possibilities. I don't think it's very safe. I don't think the children are safe. I don't think it should be around a daycare. Um, the children, like I said, it's bad enough for them to have to cross Rock Ridge without having all the additional traffic and the just additional hoopla of a business being sitting there. Yes, it's, uh, sh sh uh, does, do anybody, does anybody have any questions for Shana? Shana? Back up what the gentleman said that lives at Oxmoor. I live on CC. Oh. Yeah, no, could you give us your name and address? Please? Oh, okay. Yeah. Leona Welch. And I live at 2916 Route CC. And uh, the gentleman that was talking about the traffic, CC and Rock Ridge used to be C Highway. It went all the way to Russellville and, 
and through. And when, I mean, what he said about the traffic, it's phenomenal. They they go through, and CC, we've even had um, law involved because people were going so fast that they almost hit children, and the buses, you know, they it's just, and the subdivision that they're wanting to put in on CC, it's, it's just, it's gonna create so much traffic, it's unreal. And uh, I just wanted to back him up on what he said was true. And we'd appreciate any one that wants to come out and visit, you know, to come on out and see what we're talking about. We're, we're just trying to protect our neighborhoods. Okay. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions for Velma? No. Thank you. Uh, anyone else in the, in the audience that would like to speak in opposition? Come forward. Good evening. My name is Lori Novak. I live at 2905 Donwood Circle. That is in Lakewood subdivision, about a quarter mile on up the road. And I can't say too much more than what everybody's already said tonight, other than one thing that was not brought up is on the map that there are three stoplights there in a quarter mile radius or quarter mile length of each other. And that is a definitely a congested area pretty much any time of day, but especially you've got morning traffic and evening traffic. And it's not just Rock Ridge, you're considering all the traffic coming through those three stoplights at a time, plus added retail traffic would be just crazy. Thank you very much. Thank Does you. anybody have any questions for Lori? No. Nope. Anyone else in the crowd that would like to speak in opposition? We'll have you next. Good evening. My name is Julie Lukanoff. I live on 1803 Cedar Valley Road. I live about a mile. When you turn on Rock Ridge, my road to Cedar Valley is one mile from turning on Rock Ridge. Um, no one's really brought up the entrance to this Dollar General is going to be off of Rock Ridge, right past when you turn, make that right to turn on Rock Ridge, then the entrance is going to be there. And so when we talk about delivery trucks and we talk about t turning in and out of Dollar General of the parking lot, how is that how is that delivery truck going to make, how is that semi going to make that turn to either go in there or, or come out of there? Okay, that whole traffic light area there is so congested and the road, the road is terrible. I mean, there is, it, it, it's just terrible and, and the lights are not good. And I look at the safety, I, I've lived there for, 36 years, so um, I just wish, I hope that you all look at that uh, when you are making your decision, and I thank you. Any questions? Any questions for Julie? Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Aaron Cleethermas. I live in 2822 Rock Ridge Road. Um, I don't think I can bring too many more concerns that people haven't already stated, but just to reiterate the traffic, I live multiple houses up on 2822, and there's many mornings. Um, I look out, and I will see multiple cars, like, backed up, and sometimes I'm like, why is there a car sitting out in front of my house right now? And it's just kind of odd for where I live, but it's because traffic is already backed up that far. Um, there is a lot of confusion at the four-way stop to even turn into Rock Ridge or to continue on C or to go to CC. Um, that I'm not sure. I know there was a recent sign added for um, informing drivers to yield upon turning left for a green light. That doesn't seem to be always listened to or followed by anyone. I um, think for multiple directions, people just kind of struggle with that. That probably needs to be fixed regardless of this decision. I struggle with that, I think, usually anytime I leave. I work um, 7 to 5.30 every day for the state of Missouri. Um, I deal with traffic a ton in the morning. I'm not really sure where the comment comes from where deliveries in the morning would be beneficial as most people work in the morning. So I'm not quite sure where that stems from unless it is like a one in the morning type delivery, which then creates a sound issue. It is a pretty protected area from light. That's one of the reasons I enjoy living there. I don't enjoy um, a super crowded area. That's just not one of the reasons I chose to live there. Um, I think traffic as well as 
Uh, many other concerns like the children, safety and whatnot, um, pretty much are the main points of this that I think really need to be considered. If it does get approved, I think as Randy stated, a traffic analysis does need to occur because there's so many stoplights. You can hardly um, drive about five, six seconds before you hit another stoplight as shown on the map. So it's one of the most congested areas in Jefferson City that I know, so I just think it's an interesting choice to put a business there when there's so many other developing opportunities around Jefferson City. And there are quite a few Dollar Generals going, or already exist, so I'm just not quite sure why we need another one right there. I understand convenience. I'm sure it would benefit anyone in the room in some way or another, but it could also potentially harm more than it does good. So I think that is a big consideration that needs to be taken into account. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Aaron? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience that would like to speak in opposition? Hi, my name is Amber Bird. I live at 1901 Northwood Drive. Um, you can't see my house on the site aerial plan, but I am off that private drive right off of South Ridge. Um, something that is really important to our neighborhood is that we all purchase our property for the country-like feeling, right? However, we were annexed in, therefore we are part of the city. However, we have no city amenities, right? We don't have city sewer, we don't have city water, we have trash, but 90% of the time they come when it's snowing, they won't come at all. You might not get your trash picked up for two, three weeks at a time. So adding additional traffic to the area is already going to make us not feel like we are accepted into the city, but as well as adding additional safety features, I haven't seen anything about that. The walking traffic on Rockridge is there. There's no sidewalks, there's no shoulders, there's not enough infrastructure to really support any additional walking traffic as well as the safety of the kids. There are numerous kids that sit on Rock Ridge Road right at the edge waiting the bus. You sit there, you'll stop at least six, seven, eight times before you even get off of Rock Ridge Road. And that's just a big safety concern for the children, right? I would love for my children to go to Jeff City Public Schools, but if I don't feel like they're going to be safely picked up on a school bus, I don't really want to do that. So I appreciate everyone's time and consideration and really would hope that you would think about the future and our families. Does anyone have any questions for me? Any questions for Amber? Thank you, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience that would like to speak in opposition? Okay, seeing none. Okay, we'll go on to move. Um, we would uh, like to ask anyone else who would like to just speak on this request. Um, not necessarily in favor or to deny, but um, just to speak in general. Okay. Seeing none, we will now close testimony. Wait, Mr. Oh, Chair, yeah. it's customary to give the applicant oh, an opportunity rebuttal. to respond if they want to. I was going to ask you that. <clears throat> would, um, Bob, would you like to uh, um, comment on any of the comments that you have? Um, you have an opportunity to do that to... If you want to. I really don't have any closing. No, no closing? Sorry, I just get you to walk over again. I would just like to say thank you to all the citizens for expressing your thoughts. And again, I would hope that you would come around like so many residents do at hearings like this and end up supporting us in a big way by shopping there, working there, whatever I think you'll find us a good na a good neighbor uh, I'm surprised at the crime no crime numbers that are coming up I, I never uh, heard of those I think we would have heard from the police department if that were uh, a case well we don't and uh, uh, I guess any business is subject to uh, whatever whatever reason they want to uh, come by and show us. And uh, uh, Dollar General has dealt with it in a very meaningful way, if and when it happens. Uh, 
I pulled up to Dollar General stores in Illinois, west of Chicago, and there were two police cars there shopping. Uh, I think uh, Jefferson City has an adequate force that can deal with whatever problems occur, uh, whether it's Dollar General or in any other retailer or any other business or residents for that matter. So I have no further uh, comments unless uh, anybody on the commission has a question. Any questions for Bob? <coughs> okay, thank you. Go ahead, Penny. In listening to the testimony of the citizens, the crime was the recurring um, kind of what stuck out to me. And I'm just curious, in your corporate structure, do you have any uh, specific um, programs for crime deterrence or for um, you know the security and safety of your customers or the security and safety of your employees? Are there anything specific that you could assure citizens about uh, your addressing crime? Dollar General has a system. Uh, I can't tell you whether it's an algorithm or, or what it is, but it rates their locations. We don't just drive around the United States and say, uh, that's a great location, we want to be there. Dollar General somewhat points its finger at a particular location because it meets their criteria for less crime, uh, overall safety, what's going on in the neighborhood, and everything else. And we have actually, uh, uh, on our own, submitted other s sites that weren't given to us because we're always being asked, if you see something on the road that we missed, present it to us and we'll check it, check it out. And we've been denied on many locations because it didn't fit their crime criteria. It didn't fit their computer uh, analysis of that particular area and their database. Uh, and other than that, uh, we are not, we're a private developer developing for the company. We've been developing for them since the year 2000. Probably we quit counting at over 300 stores along a while back. And uh, uh, all I can say is if, if crime is going to hit, it can hit anywhere. And uh, they do their, their best when they select a particular location area. Uh, they might say uh, select Highway 179 and Highway C and how close can you get to it? Well, in this particular case, we got right there, right where they want to be. And we met all the criteria for their uh, crime database. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. Does anybody else have any questions for Bob? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. Um, one of the uh, individuals that spoke mentioned an issue or a concern that they had with regard to deliveries and the trucks and turning um, right onto Rockbridge Road and then turning immediately into driveway. Um, in light of the fact that the traffic is backed up throughout there um, several times throughout the day. Have you taken any consideration into that? Uh, they, they have taken that into consideration. And I think I mentioned earlier that uh, we're taking that existing traffic into that, into that store. And the I think it's more logistically how it will yeah. work to get oh. the truck in there with the traffic existing and the narrow road the way it is. Well, other than the small delivery trucks that might be coming from local uh, Jefferson City locations, uh, there's only one tractor trailer that you see on the interstates that uh, brings a, a majority of the goods. And I'm, uh, they come from Fulton, Missouri at their uh, distribution center. And David, I, I don't have the statistics on how often those deliveries are or whatever, but I, I believe they're like once every one to two weeks or something like that, and they try to keep it uh, under the peak hours. Uh, you, you might be interested in one statistic that uh, uh, Dollar Gen General has given us to uh, present, and that is the fact that on 
the high traffic days, call it Saturday, whatever, uh, there might be 30 customers total per hour, which means maybe five or six cars might be on that lot at one given time. Nobody spends the whole day in the Dollar General. They go in there, they get their product, they get back in their car, they're gone. So uh, we were in the St. Martin store at what, four o'clock? There may have been four cars there, just to give you an idea of what might happen uh, during the day or right at the school uh, let, let out time or whatever. So we're not the traffic generator that some people might perceive. Uh, it, it's not that. We're not Lowe's. We're not, we're not Target. We're not Walmart. Uh, that's a whole different classification. Uh, and uh, as mentioned, uh, our engineers and MoDOT's engineers have uh, worked out and all the details of the access and any traffic issues. And uh, that's as best as I can address the situation. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Um, so we heard a lot of people talk this evening about how many other Dollar General stores we have, <clears throat> pardon me, in the area. I was just curious to know how you determine uh, where you want to put a Dollar General. What are your, what are the factors that you look at when you decide where you want to okay. place one? We don't really <laughs> determine how many Dollar Generals go in Jefferson City or Columbia, Missouri or uh, any other it, it's based on how are those other stores performing, okay? We have a situation in a small town in Illinois right now. It's called Nashville, Illinois. Population 3,500 people. Uh, daytime population probably three or 4,000 people with the two big plants in town. And we built them a store there and the store was doing so much volume that they called us and they said, uh, we need another store and we don't care if it's two miles away, we need to take some of the pressure off of that store. Uh, we don't make that determination. They, they do based on how many stores are in Jefferson City and how are they doing and do we need more. So as a follow-up question then, the stores in Jefferson City are doing very well and, and you've determined that we need another store? No, I didn't determine anything. Who, who, and who did you say determines that? Dollar General. Okay. Yeah, based Understood. on how those stores are performing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. <clears throat> I just have, I've, I've heard over and over again about this blind spot and this curve that they're really concerned about. <clears throat> and I just want to um, see what your and how you plan to handle that. I'm, I'm not sure where, where they're referring to the, is it? I, can I, I wanna, All I, I wanna make sure the audience stays quiet, please. All I heard was there's three lights in three bad areas, but I, the blind spot, I assume you're talking about uh, South, South Bridge, is it? So I believe it's an existing situation on Rock Ridge Road, and so some of the history here, you know, is uh, you know South Ridge Drive. If you look at if you look at the really old air photos, some of which are available on uh, the online GIS system, you'll see that you know South Ridge Drive was Route C at the time, and so this curve in the property lines right there <coughs> was such that this road Route C, you know, continued on on that direction, and so when the new Route C was constructed. Uh, MoDOT, you know, came in to, you know, reconstruct this area, and so this is what, what has resulted, and so they, they did a slight movement there. But it is a, an existing situation up, up the road uh, from this particular location. Let me, let me, uh, perhaps that's something uh, MoDOT staff and uh, us as developers can discuss perhaps a, a stop sign right at that intersection. <laughs> Maybe an answer. <laughs> okay, okay. Can we please keep quiet? Thank you. 
does anybody else have any more questions for Bob? Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. Thank I appreciate you. it. Okay. <laughs> uh, we've actually closed public testimony. I, if we allowed everybody to, you know, we, uh, I think, commissioners, we've all heard and understand your concerns. And we appreciate it. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and move on to closed testimony, and we're going to get the staff report from Eric. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so as uh, presented in uh, the initial overview on the case, uh, the criteria for rezoning and for the associated comprehensive plan amendment are listed within the staff report. And so there's some commentary, you know, notes by staff regarding each of those items. Uh, also responded to by the applicant within the application materials. I'll, I'll just touch on a little bit there. Um, and so, you know, as mentioned in the, the, the opening overview, you know, a lot of our, our comments are really focused on the high traffic, you know, location. This is a, a, a major highway interchange. Uh, it's an interchange of four lane highway with a, a state highway. Um, you know, it's, uh, yes, there's several stoplights in the area that provide for connectivity to the, the other streets that are uh, accessing uh, this major road. And so it is, it is fairly typical and standard to see uh, uh, commercial developments around such interchanges. And so, you know, a lot of that you know, kind of view is that uh, this, this property, you know, the property around this interchange is, is well suited for commercial development. It's, it's well, it is located uh, by those, those, those high traffic areas. Uh, it's served by roads that have uh, <coughs> controlled access, improvement stoplights uh, on them. And it's easy to access by the public. Um, and so uh, this area, and so another you know, kind of criteria you know, pointed out within the Texas <coughs> staff report is, is the need for, uh, for commercial zoning in, in areas of town to serve, uh, to serve the community, serve the public. So this particular area you know, does, does not have a, you know, a, a lot of commercial you know, zoning. You know, there's, there's major portions of this area and you know, while there is you know several spots identified commercial in that area, if you look further further out, there are not. And so, uh, and that is some of the uh, some of the staff commentary, at least, uh, regarding the the zoning situation in the area, uh, which is is basically closely related to the same comprehensive plan discussion. The criteria are very similar. Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Chair, there's a lot of comments and, and questions. You know, I think some of them. Um, uh, uh, may have been addressed within some of the opening presentations or, or addressed uh, by the applicant. If there's anything in particular that the Planning and Zoning Commission you know, would like me to, to try to answer, I'm happy to, uh, to do so. Eric, can you tell me, is, any, is the Highway Department planning on doing anything about the road and the condition of the road and the shoulders and the, I mean, do, is there any plans that the city's aware of? You mean for the existing Route C, or oh, for Rockridge? Uh, so I, I'm not not personally aware of anything. Of course, the the boundary line uh, between the city and the county is just off the screen uh, there, and so for the majority of its stretch, it is a county road. Um, and so I kind of have to defer to our counterparts at the county um, or our public works department. Excuse me, does anyone else have any questions for staff? And then are we... No further questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. And I guess we won't do engineering or... I guess you... Uh, and so, no, there's, the, there's no engineering um, uh, staff report unless you have specific questions. I'm sure Shane would, uh, would, would answer. Um, I almost forgot. We'll go to the uh, the closing slide at least. Uh, we do have this laid out as two separate forms of motion: one for approval of the comprehensive plan amendment, uh, and then the second for uh, for the rezoning. And so, uh, comprehensive plan amendments, um, you know, according to state statute, the comprehensive plan is really a, a document of the Planning and Zoning Commission, and so you're actually the deciding body. Uh, on a comprehensive plan amendment. And then uh, when it comes to the request to rezone the property, uh, 
your your decision is actually a recommendation and so the motion for the rezoning is worded as a recommendation to the city council uh, again all motions must be positive for approval of the rezoning request but that first motion for the comprehensive plan amendment you know, again positive as all motions must be positive is for for approval of of that is for straight approval it wouldn't be you know, forwarded to the city council so uh, i hope i hope that's clear yep. and uh, uh and again it's a recommendation and so there would be a similar um public hearing uh, in front of the city council the date of that uh, if passed by this, you know, by this body this evening, you know, would be scheduled for for May fifteenth at the city council at six p.m. here in these chambers. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, uh, we're you know, myself, Shane, or any other staff are happy to answer any questions. Even if it's not passed by this body, it still goes on. It's still going to be in front of the city council. I mean, I think is that not correct? Um, So, yeah, except for that this body does have the ability to table things over, you know, except for that. Um, but typically, it would be scheduled for, th yeah, that date at the City Council, regardless of your recommendation, yes. Correct. So the motion for a recommendation of approval will be either passed in favor or passed against. If passed against, then the recommendation is a negative recommendation going to the city council. Um, yes. And that is very correct, yes. Thank you for making that point, Bunny. I'm just gonna do that myself. Um, okay, does anybody else have any questions for staff? Go ahead. Uh, um, kind of just knowing there's two separate motions. Um, what would happen like in the instance of one passes and one fail because like they kind of go hand in hand a little bit don't they so that's kind of like yes. I know they're two separate vote in that but mm -hmm. yes it would be it would be an oddity to for example deny the comprehensive plan amendment but still approve the rezoning um, the reverse would you know is, is a little bit easier to understand I think but uh, but yeah, they they do kind of come as a pair. Any comments? Would uh, denial of the first motion mean that a uh, accepted use permit would have to be done for, as a supporting for the second motion to hold? Not not any kind of separate permit, but the the rezoning one of the criteria is really you know conformance with that future land use map and so for the planning and zoning commission to you know to deny the the comprehensive plan amendment and yet you know approve or make recommendation for approval of a rezoning would be you know, kind of ignoring your own comprehensive future land use map and so again that that would be very odd um and so There's this question here, but you know, I can't stop myself. Um, I'm still thinking about that pipeline. And do we know what the level of excavation, blasting that's going to happen in order for this the structure to be built? Is there any kind of element of danger in those activities affecting that pipeline? And so it would defer to the pipeline company, and they are very involved when things are occurring, you know, near near their property. And so, you know, certainly on their property, they have you know many kind of so uh, has anybody refer to them as to the pipeline regulations. Company? And so, you know, kind of going back to their site plan, they're they're going to a fairly extreme measure in order to construct a retaining wall and stay off of that pipeline easement. And so, you know, the pipeline goes through the the entire city, and so you know we we you know we we. We come into situations where construction is, is occurring next to it. It's, it's you know it's not it, it's not difficult to manage, and and you know certainly you have to be mindful that there's an underground gasoline pipeline you know next to you, uh, but but it is you know accomplishable. <clears throat> Any further questions for staff? Okay, 
So we'll move on to a motion, uh, two motions. The first motion, would someone like to make a motion? <laughs> well, they, uh, so you're correct, right? No, I That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if there's no motion made, then that's, yeah. So unless. A motion has to be made. So it's, it's. A so a motion of either recommend or deny. No, a positive a motion, motion oh, must be positive. made. Okay, a motion, I move to recommend approval of the comprehensive plan amendment request to designate the property as commercial on the future land use map of the comprehensive plan. Second. I'll just point out that language in the staff report is slightly edited. It's not a recommendation for approval, it's to approve. So well, my apologies said, on there. Said, oh, yeah. you're so. Approval, yep. approve, mm-hmm. And so I'll defer to the text on the screen, yeah. if I may. So you got a second from, okay. Is there any discussion? Okay, all in favor, say aye. Aye. Thanks. We'll probably have to do roll call on this one. So we'll start with Hank, I, I believe, or I guess we'll start with the list here. Sorry. <clears throat> Get to that. Oh, you have it. Okay, go ahead. Quig? No. Cotton? Aye. Fretwell? Aye. Hawk? No. Young? Aye. No. Aye. Oh, okay. I've been here. Vote? Aye. Robinette? No. Warner House? No. Okay, so in this case, uh, I'm the split vote, and I, I vote aye. Come the back. <laughs> Just remember, it does not end here. It still goes on to city council. So we have another motion. Correct. <coughs> so who would like to make the motion? I move to approve the request to rezone the property from RS2 to C2. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. All right, I guess we'll do the roll call again. Mm. Quig? No. Cotton? Aye. Fretwell? Aye. Hawk? No. Young? Vote? Aye. Robinette? No. Waterhouse? No. Try again. Yep. Aye. Okay, so. Mr. Chair, this item will be forwarded to the City Council with the Planning and Zoning Commission's recommendation for approval. Uh, there will be a public hearing in front of the City Council. Uh, that will be held on May 15th at 6 p.m. in this room. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to the next case. So if anyone's here would like to um, stay, that's fine, or you can leave. Uh, I guess if we we're going to take give, a break. Give a minute just to uh, yeah. let the room clear out. Right. I say we go ahead and take a break. If we want to take a five-minute break, if anybody needs to. And then also, I guess I'll wait. Jake's probably not going to be voting on this next one. Hello. Oh. Jacob has to leave, so he won't be voting on this next one. I'll, ta I'll talk about it when we come back. Okay. Yep. You ready, Courtney? All indications have seen me. Lead me to that direction. No, not completely over. 
Um, I, I don't know.
I think it's been about five minutes. I'm going to give everybody about a one-minute warning to that we'll start it back up. I we can take a time or so. Yeah, sure oh, yeah, you too. Yeah, you too. Good luck. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Appreciate it. I'll see you next time. Yep. Okay, we're going to go ahead and, uh, oh, we're going to go ahead and start, restart the meeting again. Chairman? Yeah, sure. So just in case the person that lost a wallet that looks like this, we would obviously have to go through it and make sure that, we, yeah, that's mine. It's pretty fat. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if somebody wants to go, if, I don't know what we would do, but there's a wallet here. If somebody wants to go outside, maybe ask if somebody lost a tanned wallet with a zipper on it. Why is that right there? Okay. So uh, since we've been back, we've lost um, one voting commissioner, Jake Robinette, had to leave early. Um, and so now Sarah Michael will, oh, what's that? Oh, the, sorry, let me get to that. Okay. So now that Jacob Robinette is gone, it'll be Randy Hosselton that will be voting. Okay. It didn't look like it. We'll hold this wallet up here until somebody claims it. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Mr. So we, oh, yeah, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry. Question? No? Go ahead. Oh, yeah. I'm yeah. going to abstain from the next case. And I think we get to that. Do we not? Or I guess we do not. Yeah, if you can give us a moment to establish whether the alternate can vote in a okay in an abstention okay okay thank you no we're discussing the uh, alternate who's voting tap to arm wrestle okay I, th I think, but they're going to, that's, we'll wait for. So in the event of a abstention on a particular case, uh, yes, it, uh, the, the voting falls to the next senior alternate. And, uh, and so with the absence of Mr. Robinette, um, Ms. Hoselton, 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 thank you, is, is eligible to vote. And then with the abstention of Ms. Cotton and Ms. Michael would be eligible to vote for this case that Ms. Cotton is abstaining from. Is that clear? Yes. So basically on the next case, Bunny would be voting and, again and yep. we'll move mm -hmm. down. We'll reestablish voting at that time. Yep. Okay. All right, moving on to case number P2301010 El Dorado Drive. And Courtney, are you presenting this case? Okay. Okay, so this property is highlighted in blue and is dressed as 810 El Dorado Drive. It is located north of the intersection of El Dorado Drive and Del Cerro Drive. It is owned PUD and is currently undeveloped. Surrounding zoning includes PUD zoning to the north with office space, and then as there's a little portion of the western side of that property that does have a little bit of that RS3 medium density residential uh, adjacent to it to the north. And to the east is PUD as well, with that planning and development zoning with office space located in that zoning area. To the south is RS3, medium density residential, with single family residential uses. And the same thing is to the west with RS3, medium density residential zoning and single family residential use located adjacent west. This property, there it is again, a close up image. It's highlighted again in blue. It is approximately 3.72 acres. And in that aerial image, there's contour lines, water lines, and 
sanitary sewer lines, which the green ones are the gravity mains and the, the red dots are the manhole locations. So that gives some of those site details about this property. What they're wanting to do is two parts, but they're closely related in what they're, what they're proposing. And so the first portion of this request is a preliminary PUD plan and which proposes duplexes. The second portion is the preliminary and final subdivision plat, which would break this property up into eight different lots. So the name that they're giving, oh, and before I go into that, so the, the role of the Planning Zoning Commission as it pertains to this request is that PUD plans that are associated with subdivision plats go to you all for a review and then gets passed on to the City Council for a, a final vote. There is the preliminary and final subdivision plat and also includes those elements of the PUD plan, again, the duplexes. And so the name that they have designated for is Dogwood Park Subdivision. Again, they are proposing eight lots with the smallest being 0 0.34 acres and the largest being 0.82 acres. And for the buildings, they're proposing, again, eight duplexes. They would be, and here's a a uh, building plan of those. They would be in total 3,000 square feet, but each unit would have 1,500 square feet. The maximum height of the building would be, is, is proposed to be 25 feet. They are proposing a buffer yard as well. So on the, the western side, it will, it will range substantially. There will be a type C natural buffer yard on the west with the northern part of the El Dorado Drive property being that 50, Let me go back, sorry. Yes, so as far as the buffer yard goes, towards the north end on the western side of that property would be 50 feet type C natural buffer yard. And then as it extends southward, it'll increase to a maximum of 100 feet for that natural type C buffer yard. And then for the southern portion of the property, they're also proposing a buffer yard, a type C natural buffer yard, which would be that 50 feet. They, they're proposing a sidewalk as well for the west side of El Dorado Drive. And let's see, um, as far as that, I'm gonna go back to the, the building. So that's a visual of the building. They're proposing brick veneer and siding for the exterior and then they will also have, they're proposing asphalt roof shingles as well. And those are the, uh, that's a brief overview of what they're requesting again is a Final, or sorry, a preliminary PUD plan as well as a preliminary and final subdivision plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, do any question? Uh, do any commissioners have any questions for Courtney? Do any commissioners have any questions for staff? Okay. Uh, we will now hear per, uh, from persons who would like to present this case. Please come forward. Uh, you know the routine. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Paul Sampson, Central Missouri Professional Services, 2500 East McCarty Street. Um, I'm here tonight on this case to represent Josh Loggy, who is the contract purchaser um, of this property. Um, as Courtney explained, the uh, proposal is to build uh, or to develop eight uh, duplex lots um, for uh, rental duplexes. Um, each unit, um, as she said, um, maximum of 1,500 square foot uh, per side, uh, brick and siding, um, exteriors, um, minimum of one car garage per unit. Some units will have uh, uh, two car garages. Uh, there's a couple of different uh, floor plans. Thank you. Um, a couple of different floor plans that he is... Uh, presenting let's see what we got here so there's the uh, uh, one car garage um, floor plan and there is the two car garage floor plan I think right now the uh, one car garage floor plan is actually about 11 1200 square feet um, the two car garage unit is uh, somewhere around 1300 square feet um, uh, uh, anticipated rental rates on these units is about $1,600 per month. Um, so they'll be, uh, you know, 
pretty nice units. Um, the lots in the subdivision um, are uh, a minimum of 80 feet wide. Uh, typically for a duplex uh, RD type development, the minimum lot frontage would be 60 feet. Uh, so we're well, well in excess of that, and that is to accommodate the, uh, the larger units that they're proposing on this site. Um, you know, we'll have the standard 10-foot side yard setbacks, which is uh, the standard in any residential development. Um, and you'll notice that the, uh, the total land area of this project is 3.72 acres, um, so eight lots on, uh, you know, three and almost three-quarters acres is a, is a pretty uh, uh, low-density development. Um, as you'll notice, there's a extensive green space along the west side of the property and as well as along the south side of the property. Uh, the intent is to minimize disruption of the existing uh, ground as much as possible. When you drive out there, it's, um, you know, the, the part that's cleared is, is uh, very flat. And then as you get into the treed area, it kind of starts to go uphill. The, the intent is to not disturb any of the trees. Uh, so in the PUD plan, we have um, start off at a, um, 50 foot wide um, type C buffer. So basically 50 foot wide of the existing trees would all remain in place. As we get down to the southern end of the property, that width gets out to 100 feet wide. And then we're maintaining that 50 foot wide buffer along the south side of the property, um, which is where there's a, an existing uh, small stream that, that runs through there and crosses um, El Dorado in this location. Um, you know, El Dorado was constructed, you know, many years ago to, to help uh, um, with the state office building development. Uh, so we'll be utilizing El Dorado Drive as the, uh, as the site access. And this is kind of a unique situation because development has occurred on both ends of El Dorado, but nothing really has happened in the middle. So there's, um, you know, really no utility services other than the sanitary sewer that runs through there. So we'll be uh, extending uh, water mains, um, electric, telephone, natural gas, all those utility services will be extended through the, uh, through the area and it'll actually connect to existing services on uh, um, East Elm Street and existing utility services down on uh, Del Cerro, which is uh, just to the south. So really it, it'll provide a more robust utility system, having those two kind of separated systems um, connected through El Dorado. Uh, the, like I said, the sanitary sewer um, does exist on the site already and we'll be making sewer taps directly to that um, existing sewer main. Uh, the existing street on El Dorado, I believe is uh, 33 feet wide. So that is uh, wide enough to allow parking on one side of the street. Uh, currently, there's no prohibition of parking on El Dorado. So in talking with the city staff, we uh, would, uh, as this goes through to the city council, we would uh, be in support of uh, uh, making a prohibition of parking on the east side of El Dorado, uh, which would per, uh, permit parking on the west side, uh, which would go along with the uh, sidewalks that would be constructed um, along that side of the road to uh, serve as a uh, pedestrian connectivity between the uh, Del Cerro neighborhood and then uh, to uh, East Elm to the north. Let's see if I'm missing anything. I think that really uh, covers most of it. Um, we did get uh, copies of the um, some resident um, correspondence and I think you guys have got that in the packet um, one of the comments that I'll just address uh, uh, pertains to stormwater drainage um, there was a, a, a video that was submitted showing kind of an overflow of a uh, existing stormwater detention basin um, let's see I think I've got that There we go. So the project location is up here. This is uh, Del, uh, El Dorado, and then Del Cerro is here. And this is the location of the stormwater detention basin that was the, the subject of the, um, of the correspondence. 
this stormwater detention basin is actually not in the same stormwater basin that um, is directly uh, adjacent to this proposed property. Uh, the stormwater um, from this area uh, flows across the very southern border of this property and then crosses in a uh, stormwater pipe, which I will just, uh, and I've mentioned this to city staff, is uh, um, highly uh, plugged up and uh, not working very well. So I hope that the city staff will go out and take care of that. But um, regardless, downstream of this detention basin is uh, flows into the creek, which is located on the east side of um, El Dorado. So that's really doesn't directly impact or have any bearing on um, the uh, stormwater for, for this particular property. Um, all the floor elevations on the, uh, um, of, the, of the units have all been set to, well, there be, you know, probably a, a minimum of one foot above the existing curb and gutter on the road. Um, so that'll provide uh, locations where the existing surface runoff through the uh, natural area can make its way to the existing stormwater system that's, uh, that's located in the street. So um, r really from a development standpoint, the, the stormwater impacts for this type of development, particularly with the large green spaces, is um, pretty minimal. Um, there was a comment about water supply. Again, we'll, we'll be addressing that by extending the water main and, and connecting those two kind of separated systems. So we think that uh, um, that will imp probably improve the situation for the water company. Uh, fire hydrants will be constructed every 600 feet along um, Del Cerro as, or El Dorado. I get my streets confused. El Dorado, um, as required by city code. Um, there was a uh, comment about street lighting and the desire to have a less have less street lighting. Um, unfortunately, in this situation, we have to follow the city code, and the city code requires street lights to be placed every 300 feet. So um, that's something that uh, um, we will be uh, installing. I will say that all the newer type um, LED fixtures are much much more efficient as far as directing light downward onto pavement um, as opposed to the uh, older uh, metal halide and, and those type of fixtures which kind of throw light everywhere. So um, I will say that the newer fixtures are, are much more efficient in, uh, in that manner. Um, I think that really addresses most of the uh, of the comments that have been made. Um, with that, I'll answer any questions. All right. Go ahead. So I just want to clarify, because I'm looking at uh, one of the, it is going to be 100 feet on the south side, the setback. Uh, the uh, Hold on one minute. If you're abstaining, you can't question. I can't question? Oh, not if okay. you're abstaining. <laughs> So if we go to, so basically it's 50 feet here. It goes to 100 feet wide, measured perpendicularly to the west property line here. And then it's 50 feet from that same point to the south property line. So that south, um, the buffer area parallel to the south property line is 50 feet wide which basically encompasses the majority of the, uh, the, the creek area um, and uh, make, forces that unit to be closer to the north side of the, of the property. <clears throat> I know we, um, we you know, can't control what he does with these properties, but um, is he building this for himself or will these be sold? Um, we can let Mr. Loggy oh, okay. come up and, yeah. and just kind of talk about how he is, uh, you know, planning to operate planning that and, and that type of thing. That'd be okay. good to hear from him. Does anybody else have any questions through money? <laughs> okay. All right. Thank well, you. Appreciate it. And then, yeah, uh, next person who'd like to present this case and give us your name and address. Okay. 
uh, I'm Josh Loggy. Uh, my address is 24 Loggy Lane in Henley, Missouri. <coughs> and um, he pretty much covered everything, uh, I think, for the most part. Um, we are planning on putting dogwood trees in the front of each unit, so there'll be a tree in each unit. That's kind of what we went with the name. Um, that's, I mean, kind of, what was the other question you had? Uh, that was pr pretty much it. Just really, um, you know, I, I think that maintenance is, you know, a probably. We are going to keep them all. Right. Uh, we're not planning on selling any of them at this time. We're going to keep them, rent them all, uh, maintain them all. And they would all be mowed at the same time. And you know, Yeah, to, yeah, to, we're going to have a, a yeah, our trash and grass cutting, and we're going to maintain everything. Yeah. And state for the record, I'm Shannon Loggy, his wife on the project, so I thought I'd jump yeah. up. Do you live in the same location? Yeah, yeah we do. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I mean, I that was just my thought is, yeah. you know, because, you know, some people might develop them and then sell them off, and you have individual owners, which, you know, yeah. you may do later on down the road. We can't control that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as far as lighting goes, I think I did have a light, an old street light, like you were talking about in front of my house, the old one, and they were terrible. The new ones are much better, and I do think it does provide safety with the sidewalks, so I don't think it's uh, going to be a terrible thing. Um, and I really don't have any other questions than that. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Josh or Lori? Shannon? Shannon? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> There is no. There is no. And also, just to kind of point it out too, I, from a transition point of view, I kind of feel like that's probably a pretty good transition, in my opinion. I know some of the audience may not like that, but to go from residential to residential income, that's on the high end. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. do need more housing in this town, so yeah. thank you for doing that. It's not cheap housing though but yeah, it's correct not. and we see that need because we build Our houses yeah. and that's I, what we do for and so many right. people actually come to us looking for rentals and you'd be surprised at how many people want a higher end rental that same can't find phone them. calls all the time and i don't even yeah. deal in residential yeah uh, you know our rentals so yeah. um but I, I you know i think the transition is good in my opinion that okay. my comment on that thank you any other questions any more questions for yeah. presenter all right no thank, thank you. you i appreciate it and there's no one else here to present the case, right? Okay. Um, okay, we'll move on to, <clears throat> is there anyone present who would like to speak in opposition of this request? Go ahead. Oh, did we do that first? Oh, did I do? Oh, hold on one second. Sorry, I did it out of order. I do that sometimes. Is there anyone present in the audience who would like to speak in favor of this request? Okay, now we'll move on to opposition. And if you would just give us your name and number, or excuse me, name, your name and address, and your social security. Hi, my name is Jason Schulte, and I'm at 101 El Dorado Drive. And there's a few concerns that I would like to address uh, regarding this um, uh, apartments to be built. Um, one of the main ones is in regards to uh, uh, potential of increased uh, crime activity in the uh, neighborhood of mine there. Um, since I'd be the closest, I'm like literally the first house on El Dorado that you come to from the apartments there. Um, one of the things is, is um, it's, it's well known that rental properties and public properties are associated with more crime uh, due to factors um, such as uh, socioeconomic disadvantage and tenants and also social isolation. Um, this leads to other such things in the area, such as uh, potential break-ins, um, which has also uh, been shown to be common in apartment communities rather than single family districts. Um, the other thing is um, there's also an increase in uh, uh, illegal activities that could occur um, that has been also known to accompany uh, apartment communities as well and bring stuff into an area that is, uh, for the most part, as I know, non-existent in my part. So that's uh, another main concern. And also there is a potential as well for uh, increased uh, violence, such as uh, domestic, um, also uh, 
Gun violence could be a case. I know a lot of us hear all the time of what goes on in Columbia with gun violence. Um, so I don't want to have anything like that potentially be brought into the neighborhood area uh, being that close. Uh, another thing is um, the disturbances occur from the traffic. So there is going to be an increased uh, uh, traffic presence from the apartments. Um, and also, like um, he was talking about, the parking is another big thing as well. Um, I know if any of you ever went down through Elm Street, uh, you have to battle through all the people parking on the side of the street at that point. A lot of times you have to stop and give way to somebody else coming through because there just ain't room for multiple people to get through on uh, both sides of the lane with people parking all the time. And uh, more than likely, it's probably going to happen that people's going to end up parking over in the state parking lot too because they're going to run out of spots uh, when people come to these apartments. Um, the other thing too is... Um, uh, security aspect of it. So I don't know, like having more people in the area is going to bring a variety of people in that you don't know who they are uh, constantly changing out. So that's that's a big concern. Um, whereas people that live inside of a of the residential homes typically stay and uh, they're resold and and so on from that aspect. Um, but another thing, too, is... Um, so I, sh I should have said this before you okay. you got up here, and I apologize. Yep. Uh, we're going to give everybody three minutes to okay. talk just to kind of keep the meeting moving. Yeah. Uh, I didn't tell you that. I just okay. want to let everybody else know. Just but a few go more ahead points. And, yeah. uh, sure. The other thing is noise, too. Um, being in a neighborhood I'm in now is relatively quiet for the most part this time. Um, you're going to have more people moving in in these apartments. Um, also, it's going to bring in... Um, like I consider uh, booming stereo systems, you know, people in apartments a lot of times might be up various hours of the night and throughout the day, so that's going to be consistent concern. Um, privacy issues as well. Um, I don't know how it's going to be constructed on stuff there for uh, keeping it kind of separate from the rest of the neighborhood, but uh, that would be a concern around, especially people that live close to it. Um, and also the biggest thing is property values. So. Um, it's also known that in general, homes nearby apartments or commercial uh, properties are not considered favorable typically. And um, so a lot of times you expect places that's in the areas close to that to have a lower value than what they would have had before. Um, so another thing is quality of construction and that. Um, I know there would kind of be an upper end uh, income level to get into those. Um, but also, everything degrades over time. So, you know, there's a concern of how well it's going to be kept up and who for sure is going to um, keep gonna, owning I'm it. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds. Okay. <laughs> and another thing is, too, is um, I think it's kind of a wrong area um, to put in these apartments uh, close to a residential town uh, here. So there's a lot of things to consider. Um, usually apartments are put in such as, like, wood lander apartment areas, Hawthorne Park apartments, uh, weathered rock apartments, uh, also like Jefferson West apartments, Ventura Avenue apartments, and Kingsington Park apartments. A lot of those is built in a Pacific area where they're all conjoined together and they're not like considered in part of a residential area. So that's another thing that I don't like uh, having these things built in such areas around us. And um, one last thing um, regarding the flooding issue, uh, that area does get really marshy and wet. And in um, I'm gonna have to cut you off. Yeah, July 19 of 2020, there was a flood that goes through, so that area does flood. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you coming up, and sorry about shortening your time. Uh, anybody else that wants to come up and speak in opposition, we're gonna give everybody th uh, three minutes to. Give us our, their point across. My name is Joyce Rennick. I live at 1616 Del Cerro. I've lived there 33 years. Um, I agree with what was just said. We've had homes that's recently sold for 300,000 plus, and this is being proposed in their backyards. Um, I feel like it could be better built um, other places, maybe Ramada Ford, the old Ramada Ford on Jefferson Street. You could have plenty of housing there. Um, there's a lot of state workers that walk the streets. Um, I understand that they're going to allow pets, small pets. Is there going to be fencing for these homes? 
um, what is the income for these homes? Is there an age limit? How many people are going to be allowed in each duplex? Um, you know, it, like I said, the storm water, traffic study. Um, he did mention the maintenance on the yards. Um, and just that I don't think it's a good idea to have this in rental in this area for the homes of what are being sold. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions for Joyce? My name's Janet Valentine, and I live at 905 El Cerrito Court. It's a cul-de-sac off Del Ciro. And this uh, issue has come up. I wonder why it's come up twice in about three years. Given I drove from the east side here, and I appreciate that we need rental property, and we surely do. But I pass a huge lot on the corner of Lafayette and McCarty. I passed another huge lot, the same side of the street, before I come to this building. What other places have been investigated to place these apartments? This is like a strip mall area. And they did talk about undeveloped area that the houses will back up to, or these apartments will back up to. It's a small hill, a big hill. And I happen to be on the other side of it. We still have deer, red fox, owls that live there and they will be disturbed, and we may eliminate the wildlife with this much building, this many people. I also have a duplex that, I, that we own that I can hardly believe there's enough room if we have children in these rentals to play. I also know the state workers walk those areas. Even with the sidewalks, there should not be any parking on that street at all, particularly if we only have one and two bed, two garage for those homes. I would like them to investigate other areas in the city for income, and I think my house payment didn't even cost this for a rental, and it's 3,000 square feet. Hi. When, when did you buy your home? We've lived there 33 years. We 33. moved. We're transit military people who moved and have settled there. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you. From 91. <clears throat> yeah, my my house payment's also a lot less. It's mm -hmm. changed a lot. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Do we have any questions? Does anybody have any questions for uh, Jana? Janet? Janet. Janet or Janet? Janet. Janet. Sorry. No. Thank Did, you. Have you looked at other areas to build the vacant lots that are? We, um, I mean, you we're, can we're, see the city trolley. If you guys want, if you guys want, if you want to talk after this, that's fine. But okay. this is just for uh, people that want to come up with an opposition. But this has come up twice. In I know. About three but if years. you want to have that conversation privately with him, you can do that. But it wasn't him the last time. What do you mean? It wasn't him that proposed the last time. Oh well, right. It has, so this has nothing. The last okay. time has nothing thank to do you. with him. But thank you for coming up. I appreciate it. Anybody else that would like to speak in opposition of this? Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> my name is Scott Randolph. I live at 1623 Del Cerro. We are the property that is the uh, on uh, butts the uh, southernmost uh, portion of the the property that we're talking about. Um, my wife and I, um, Susan, uh, we wholeheartedly support the city's goal of increasing the amount of accessible housing in our community. It's something that we need and we support that. But we think also that that can be accomplished while balancing out the um, concerns about property values and protecting a quality of life that we have and our neighbors have in, in this area. So with that, I'd like to raise uh, several concerns um, very quickly because um, we were the ones that did submit written comments. Uh, we submitted the video that showed the flooding. Uh, that was taken by one of our neighbors. You can take a look at that. Um, I'm not sure exactly what a lot of that came, you know, where it came from, but we've always heard that there's problems with flooding in the area. Um, so let me go first off to the, the stormwater issue. 
I, and I'm not an engineer and all the experts are here, but I can observe a lot of things. Um, on the west side of the property is a very steep hill. Uh, water flows down from that, that hill um, from the neighborhood above it. Uh, there's a church down at the bottom of that uh, section up on top of the hill. Water flows from that church area from that, um, uh, from that street down to the drainage ditch. And actually today you could go and look and there are huge trees that have been knocked over that have been in the path of the drainage of the water that comes down off of that street. They're about this big. That came, came down over the last few months. So th there is a water drainage issue going on uh, there. Uh, I walk that property sometimes, just go out into the field, and I can tell you right now, even though it hasn't rained, it's soggy. There's wet places there. So the water does come down, and it sinks down into the, to the ground there. So as we're building more property there, I'm concerned about what is going to happen in the future. Uh, when you take a look at the southernmost part where we come up, our property is up against the, uh, probably, I guess it, it's, it's lot number eight down there that we were talking about. Um, the 50-foot buffer that is proposed down at the south side coincides directly with the what's called the arch box culvert. Uh, that is actually in the middle of the creek. The 50-foot buffer is actually in the middle of the creek, in the middle of the drainage. Um, you can't see the arch box culvert. There's nothing there. It's either buried or it, it never existed. And so there's nothing that's actually draining a lot of give that. give you about 20, 30 seconds to... <laughs> I know that's not a, a okay, lot of so, time, but... So what I would propose or what we would like to see is uh, the buffer of the south side increased to 100 feet and a row of uh, buffer trees planted because what is planted there, what is there now is basically trash trees with a bunch of vines on it. Uh, we think that would help a lot in the, other, the south part of, uh, of there. I can't believe that you're going it, to... It's concerned me that that eighth unit is actually going to be built on part of the creek bed uh, that I see there today. I want to echo a couple of things on the, on the parking or on the traffic. Um, the speed limit is not enforced on El Dorado, and you do have... Today, this was a nice day. There was probably two to three dozen... Um, I'm about, I'm about state to, workers I'm about that are going to, down through there. I'm about so. to cut you off. So okay. Is so. it the speed limit, the speed uh, for the vehicles? Uh, yeah, and I just want to echo, you know, um, the concerns about keeping the maintenance of the property and, right. um, uh, okay. you know, and yeah, that type of thing. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Oh, but before you go, does anybody have any questions for, for Scott? The, Scott, the, the church that you were talking about, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you're talking about the creek bed. When I was out there today, I saw there's a sign that says sewer utility, mm -hmm. and there was a big manhole cover. Yeah. Is that the creek bed you're talking about? Yeah. That, uh, according to the plot, that manhole cover is actually on the uh, unit number eight, I'll call it, the southernmost unit. It's, it's sort of on the driveway of that unit and if you look over just to the left of that manhole it's all swampy looking creek bed area mm -hmm. yeah it's all a creek bed up there and that drainage there's a lot of water that does drain um, from that church area down through that wooded area and it all goes down into there so I'm concerned what happens to that in the future and as I said you can't see a culvert there. There's no evidence of any drainage that's even there today. Uh yes, yes, it does. And it goes past the, the Mobley's property back there. Yeah, it goes the creek goes all the way back up. It it actually goes behind a good number of properties on Del Cerro. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah. Does anybody else have any questions for Scott? Thank you. Can I ask you a question? Can I ask staff a question yeah, real quick? Uh, what came first, 
P, the P, the area we're talking about for development or the subdivision? Because the buildings down there used to be Missouri Department of uh, something, state building? I mean, I know that the Del Cerro subdivision developed over many years right. in several sections. Um, I remember when the last section came in, I processed that, that request right. but, and looked at some of the history at the time. The, and that's the, the patrol was out there? I, I believe partially so. Or yeah, I can't uh, answer. There was just a question I had, I, I but yeah. Thought I'd ask about. Um, Cause hold on one moment. Yeah, because the PUD. Yeah. I I I think I, I believe that the office development came first. And, you know, if you look at some of the stormwater infrastructure that was put in place in the neighboring subdivision, you know, it was, you know, the, you know, the video which was distributed to the Planning Zoning Commissioner, commission as some pictures some screenshots out of that video. You know, it was a picture of, of that detention basin overflowing during, um, I think it, some context there is that is uh, literally a 1,000 year storm, a 1,000 year storm. <laughs> And so a very odd event um, where the, the water was going across that basin and, uh, and flowing through the yard and so not, not causing damage to structures. Um, but, um, you know, this particular development, I believe this is uh, essentially the, I, I believe it's the last part of the undeveloped property for this, uh, what was an office park, uh, you know, put in place there that consists of the, uh, so the state office buildings that are privately owned uh, and, and rented to the state and some other office buildings in that area. And so, right. yeah, okay. I think. And I guess yeah, that's all I have for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do we, sorry. Yeah, so yes, please come up uh, uh, in opposition. Yeah. Yes, uh, give us your name and address, please. Hey, I'm Rebecca Wood and I live at 1724 Daryl Cyril. And uh, I would just like to say that um, I can't imagine there being eight subdivisions with 16 families living there. I mean, it would just be awful, the traffic mm -hmm. and the state workers that walk there, plus the traffic that goes in and out of mental health. I mean, right now, and that's not a very wide street at all. And uh, I just think that, you know, in addition to it, um, devaluing the homes that live up on uh, Del Cerro and El Dorado, you know, um, and someone had pointed out that like on Elm Street, sometimes the traffic, they park on one side of the street and you can't hardly get through sometime. And I believe that it would turn into the same thing there on uh, El Dorado. But uh, I hope that this does not get approved. You know, a lot of people walk their dogs and if the families living there are gonna have dogs too, it's just gonna be a really bad, I think, situation. So I uh, hope that it does not get approved. So. Thank you. Any it, questions, any questions for Rebecca? No. Thank you very okay. much. Anyone else in the audience that would like to speak in opposition? Okay, we got. Okay. I'm Sam Cornett. I live at 1011 El Dorado Drive. I'm about halfway up the hill there on El Dorado. Um, I oppose this simply because. Everybody has a perfect plan in the beginning. The real world knows that those will eventually turn into holes. Eventually. It's going to happen. They'll turn into holes in the wall. They'll be a sl it'll basically be a slum. It, it never intended to happen, but it will over time. They will devalue our properties. And over time, maybe not immediately, but over time, will increase the crime in our neighborhood. People parking down there on that street is going to be a nightmare, just like they mentioned before on Elm Street. Just because you put a sign up that says you can only park on one side of the road doesn't mean it happens all the time. I drive on Elm Street every morning going to work, and three out of the five days every week, there's somebody parked on the wrong side on Elm Street blocking up traffic. And that happened right away but it will happen it's just 
it's a beautiful neighborhood. It's quiet. The loudest thing in the neighborhood is probably my little ankle biter dog. But I'm just opposed to it. It's, it's going to devalue our homes and our neighborhood. That's all I have to say. Any questions for Sam? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aaron Brimmer. I live at 1717 Del Cerro. Like you said, it is a nice neighborhood and it's quiet. Uh, the crime rate, I don't believe, is going to go up, but it's the simple fact that El Dorado is a snow route, and if they do park in front, what are they going to do? Plow them over? Can't do that. Um, there is, I've lived there for four or five years now, and yeah, it is a marshy area. So just watching out for the foundations for the buildings to settle, they're going to end up not selling right because it's a marshy area. I'm just watching out for their their behalf of of their development. So either way. Any other questions for Aaron? Thank you. I appreciate it. I saw cut yeah, a few hands. I'm Ron Timmy, uh live in seventeen forty five Del Cerro. I'm just uh, want to echo the concern for property values and, and uh, safety and crime. Uh, I learned firsthand with experience living out in Munichburg what happens when things turn into rentals. I, I owned a house there for 30 years. I bought back in 1980. It was all older folks that lived there. It was a great place to raise a family. And then as the older folks died, it became rental. With the rental came crime. And, and it, it's bad there, and that's the reason we searched for several years to find a good neighbor to move into, a good neighborhood to move into, which was uh, Arndell Cerro. Uh, we wanted to escape the problems that we, we experienced there in, in uh, Munichburg. Uh, so uh, that, uh, that's what I want to say is, as things turn into rental, crime does follow it. Thank you. Any questions for? Ron? No, thank you, Ron. Sure. Hi there, my name is Susan Randolph and I live at 1623 Del Cerro um, with Scott. <laughs> um, the house that will adjoin the um, the section with the eighth unit on the south side. And I just want to echo the concerns about the stormwater. I submitted the video from a neighbor, and I, if I understand correctly, that's a different watershed, that, that that flooding is in a different area. But it's within a few feet of the intersection of El Dorado and Del Cerro. Um, and I understand that there, and I've seen pictures of El Dorado and Del Cerro being underwater. I live on that corner. Um, then El Dorado and East Elm being underwater during heavy rains. And you have to admit there's uh, increasing frequency of these freak heavy rains. So I feel like I support affordable housing, more housing, we need it. I'd like to find a way to address our concerns. I'd like to hear some reassurances that the um, stormwater issue is going to be addressed because that's two watersheds kind of coming together in a r real small area. The other thing I felt was a little bit dismissive was the concern about um, the water supply for uh, the fire, um, if there's a fire. We saw uh, a really bad fire at the um, state building, that, the building that housed state workers um, just a couple of years ago, uh, November 1st of 2021, and the fire department was quoted 
in the paper saying this fire's taken a lot longer to put out because of the water supply. So rather than just saying, oh, we're going to hook it up and it's going to be okay, I'd, I'd like some reassurances that we're going to have the water we need if there is a fire and that these people are developing this nice duplex that those people are going to be safe and have enough water so um i just would like to hear that this is going to go slow enough that we can address the concerns so everybody's going to be able to live you know have what they need in this new development and i think uh and i am the nut about the lighting uh i really want some assurances about um, that there will not be light pollution because there's already light pollution in my bedroom every night from the State Department and uh, it affects how I sleep. So I am very concerned being that close that <clears throat> there's not going to be increased light in so, my um, bedroom. So Ding. we're at three minutes, but um, I will tell you the lighting situation is more of a city. I know that it's going to need lighting because of this development but that would be more of a city you know um, yeah it's the type of lighting it's yeah. not I understand there there is a requirement for lighting but uh, there's cities all across the country adopting yeah. quality lighting that serves the purpose but it doesn't um, over illuminate and cause light pollution where it's not needed such right. as my backyard right <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you. Any, thank you. Any questions? questions for uh, Susan? Mrs. Randolph, um, one thing I, I think I picked up on was that Mr. Um, Sampson, right, he indicated that he thought that there was some debris or something in one of the drainage areas mm -hmm. for the rain runoff as well, and he mentioned to the city that maybe that's something that needs to be looked into. So hopefully we can get that done and that can help solve that problem. Yeah, I, I just would like to see some energy put into that and making sure that we're not going to have a driveway right next to where the water's flowing that's going to wash out, crumble. The streets at El Dorado and Del Cerro all have big holes from water flowing under the pavement. So um, it's an issue in that area. There's Sounds just like no it. denying it. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you. Oh, do we have a, oh, who has, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, we, have, we have quick, a question I, for you. Real quick. I wanted to, did I understand Mr. Sampson said earlier that the utility systems are going to be tied together and make, make them stronger and what the, better than what they are now? Does that include the water? Yes. Okay. We can probably have, sure, I, I guess. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I can address <laughs> some of that with my staff report yeah, later down the road. We'll have Shane so, address it. Well, just quick answer, yes. Uh, you know, and as far as water pressures and things like that, you know, a lot of the utility services uh, in town are dictated by, uh, you know, sanitary sewers run by the city of Jefferson. Uh, water, depending on where you're at, is either run by Missouri American or one of the local yeah. water districts. You know, developers don't have, um, you know, the utility service providers will indicate if you're trying to do something that is that their systems are not able to handle. Um, you know, we work very closely with all the utility companies when we do projects like this to uh, to make sure that uh, you know make sure that all the utility services that are needed for a, a given development are, are in place. And um, you know, particularly if there's a development, and uh, the utility companies love to stick developers with uh, costs to improve their systems. So. Um, that's something we see quite frequently. So I'm, I'm very confident that, uh, uh, you know, there's no issue with Missouri American as far as uh, water service, you know, connecting these two, um, connecting these two systems together. Um, you know, and the, the large fire is kind of a uh, uh, outlier as far as, uh, you know, size of uh, fire and those types of things. So, I mean, um, I'll, anyway, I've got some more comments I'll make yeah. later. Shane, you had something to comment. Do we? I don't I know. Is this? It's probably comments. not the. We'll, I can address a lot of these right. comments in my staff report. Okay, before. that's what we'll do. Yeah, thank you. Is there anyone else in the? Okay. 
Hi, I'm Suzanne Schneider. I live at 1720 Del Cerro Drive. We've lived there since 1999. It's a neighborhood of families, neighborhood of retirees, senior citizens. It's been a great neighborhood. I walk in that neighborhood all the time. I walk in that area almost every day. People walk their dogs. It's a great place. But there are state employees there too. Two people on one side, three, four, five people on the other side. One car goes through there. You're going to have more traffic. It's going to be difficult. It's just going to be difficult. More difficult than it is now. What was your name again? Suzanne Schneider. Suzanne Schneider. Does anybody have any questions for Suzanne? I just to make sure I understand where you're walking. Won't the sidewalk help with that? To some degree. Okay. Will the sidewalk be on, bo on one side or both yeah, sides? Yeah, and I was just trying to make sure I understood where you were talking about people one. walking. I'm walking on one side of the street toward Elm Street. State employees will be walking on the other side of the street. Okay. And honestly, one car can get through there. Because if you're walking side by side, and they're walking two and three and four across, that street narrows. And that's, that's what I see. I walk mm -hmm. down there a lot. Okay. Thank you. So. Anyone else in the audience that like like to speak in opposition? Okay. Seeing none, is there anyone present who would like to just speak on this request? I think we're going to give you a chance. If nobody, well, we are going to give you a chance. Um, do you want to just speak in neither in favor or opposition? Opposition. Opposition. Okay. If I've already closed it, do we still? No. Yeah. Come on up. I stay. I'm Rolanda Schulte. I stay at 1001 El Dorado periodically. I have a farm of my own, but I stay there once in a while. And I would just like to say, you do not build apartments in a good neighborhood. Apartments go in other neighborhoods by themselves. You do not turn a good neighborhood into a bad neighborhood, whether it's a year from now, 10 years from now, or whatever. That's all I have to say. You don't do that to people who's lived there, bought their houses in a good neighborhood. That was Rolanda? Rolanda. Rolanda, thank you. Any questions for Rolanda? Okay, is there anyone else? Okay. My name's Terry Mobley. I live 1619 Del Cerro. I've been there since 1988. And Scott Reynolds lives beside me in the creek. I, the unions call it a creek. I call it a drainage ditch because the water from up the hill, above the hills where they're talking about building, sometimes it it's runs through there fast. And like lot eight there where Scott was talking about you can go there today and it's mushy and wet and I don't know where that water goes but it runs through that creek and it don't go under the road that's why the road is all getting buckled in that and I, I'm, I'm like Scott and Jack and Joyce affordable housing is needed in Jeff City but it's not needed in a neighborhood I was one of the first homes in on Del Cerro. El Dorado wasn't even all the way through or, or Del Cerro. And that's one reason we built there, because it was quiet. And it is quiet, and neighbors are friendly. You see people walking every day. The highway patrol walk their troopers, train their troopers up and down the hill every, every time they have a class. And with all the traffic that's going to be there, and the parking, and those, I just don't see how much, how you're going to have enough room for the parking. They're going to be taking up the state, state parking lot, and that's going to create problems for the city. So, and I just think there's better alternatives to build apartments without bothering a nice neighborhood. Any questions? Any questions for Terry? Th thank you, Terry. 
Anyone else in opposition? If we'll have you come up uh, to the microphone so that I'll just I heard her I'll I'll address it. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, he's going to address it here in a second. Do we have anybody else in opposition? Going once, going twice. So nobody else in opposition. Okay. Now we're going to um, <clears throat> close testimony and we'll move on to Courtney's. Oh, sorry. Yes. I don't know. Uh, I follow this thing too closely. Thank you. So I will address some of the uh, no. comments that were made. Um, First of all, there was a lot of reference to apartments. These are not apartments. These are duplexes. Two units per building. That's what a duplex looks like. Looks like a lot like a single family home that just happens to have two families in it. There was a lot of comments about criminal activity. Since when is rental, being a renter, automatically make you a criminal? You know, I do this every month. You guys see me up here every month. and. The last two to three meetings, we had the same discussion. We have people that are here willing to put housing in. We've got developers that want to put housing in. And there's this constant parade of we want housing as long as it's not in our backyard. So I would really implore the commission to um, look at everything factually. Let's not look at scare, ta scare tactics of everybody that is a renter, renter is a criminal and brings criminal activity into a neighborhood, I would have no problem um, living you know, in the next neighborhood from that unit. Um, if you look at where this location is situated, there's a clear break in this location right here. The Del Cerro subdivision stops right here. Beyond that um, is, was part of the original, I think it was originally 30 acre um, office complex development. I'm suspecting that's where the original PUD zoning came in, and this is the last piece that uh, um, is owned. Actually, it's owned by the uh, Twee House family, and they're the they're current property owners. And uh, Mr. Loggy has a contract to purchase the property, and this is the last piece of that. So I'm suspecting that that's where the uh, the PUD zoning came in at. Um, as far as the question about how many people will be allowed to live in here. It's a duplex. There's two bedrooms. Anybody who wants to live in a two-bedroom unit, just like a two-bedroom house, that's how many people would be able to live there. Um, one thing that hasn't been brought up, well, it was briefly brought up, but I think is a really important point, is that um, it was mentioned that a couple years ago, this property was the subject of a MHDC housing project. Um, and I don't know if uh, how everyone from is familiar with those, but it's a tax credit project that the uh, uh, Missouri Housing Development Corporation um, utilizes to encourage developers to develop housing. Um, it's not Section 8 housing. The construction of the uh, units is uh, subsidized, but the rentals um, are not necessarily sub sub subsidized. Um, I believe the, uh, and this is truly an apartment that was originally proposed a couple of years ago, was 48 units. I would really caution the neighbors, and this is not meant to be a scare tactic, this is the facts. I would really caution the neighbors on fighting too much with this proposal because it's very likely a MHDC 48 unit apartment complex could be proposed here again. So. In my opinion, I would take eight duplexes over 48 apartments every day. I would take that in my neighborhood every day. So I would caution, and, and like I said, this is not scare tactic, this is facts. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, on street park, or off street parking. Um, as I said, the, each unit will either have a, t a single car or two car garage. The units that have the single car garage would have a two car wide um, driveway. So, you know, for your uh, you know, typical two family uh, situation, 
there would be uh, not a lot of need for uh, on-street parking. So while uh, the on-street parking would be allowed for visitors and things, um, you know, so with a two-car garage and a driveway, you could fit four, four cars per unit um, and not be parking on the street. So I really don't see the uh, um, on-street parking as a big issue. Uh, some of the comments on stormwater that were brought up are, are comments that are probably really directed more towards a big picture stormwater issue, which there's many of those around town. Um, nothing, you know, when you look at the size of this development and the, uh, the green space that we're leaving, you look at the drainage area that this encompasses, um, what's being proposed here is a very small drop in the bucket, um, literally, compared to uh, the rest of the drainage area that goes into this. So, you know, I think we have to make a clear distinction between items that are specific to this project versus things that are more of a uh, large general nature. Um, you know, the uh, $1,600 a month target rental rate, you know, that's, that's as much or more than a lot of people's mortgage payments are. So, um, again, that goes back to the, uh, um, the discrimination is what I would call it against, against renters. So I'm going to get off my soapbox now and go sit down unless you have any questions. I believe it's 33 feet. Twenty-eight feet would allow you to have parking on one side of the street. Yes, so thirty-three feet is actually would get you to parking on both sides. Correct. Anything else? Just one side. Yeah, we uh, Shane and I talked prior to the meeting and. Uh, um, Typically, the way we've been, uh, that's right. Oh. <laughs> um, typically, the way we've been doing subdivisions of late is um, dictating the parking at the time the subdivision plat is approved. So when the uh, uh, final subdivision plats go to the city council, they have another bill that goes along with that that dictates which side the parking goes on. We usually include that as a note in a preliminary plat here at planning and zoning. Um, but in this case, since the, the road is already there, um, you know, we kind of have to, and there's no, uh, the, the road itself is not part of the subdivision plat, then we have to kind of uh, make up for that lack of planning previously. So um, yeah, we'd be in support of eliminating parking on the east side of the road and only allowing it on the west side. Any more questions for Paul? Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, um, I'm not sure if this is for you or for the developer, but we heard um, some concerns about, you know, what the ongoing maintenance and upkeep would be. I, I am familiar with MHDC, and, I, and the, one of the things that surprised me with some of those projects that were recently before them was that a lot of times when you get those types of tax credits and incentives, um, those those places are very well kept, right? I mean, they have to be. So that's kind of what's stunning about um, the rejection of that because those mm -hmm. properties. But here we have a private developer that I, I understand is wanting to, to invest his own money. He's not seeking any type of incentives to do that. Um, so could you just address for everyone what, what the plan is for, for the upkeep and the ongoing maintenance so that um, we have some reassurance that these aren't going to be, you know, let go and, and, and run down. Right. Well, and, and I'll, if Josh wants to, I'll let him uh, kind of tag on to what I'm going to say, though. But um, so at $1,600 a rent, you know, like we said, that's a, a pretty high price point on rentals. Um, you know, in order for him to be able to get that kind of rent, he's got to keep them up. You know, that's just common sense. Um, so I think, you know, in his business model, he can't, he can't afford to let the things go because, you know, for, you know, so these things are 3,000 square feet and I'm going to, you know, he, he knows what they're going to cost, but I'm going to make a stab at it. You know, they're probably, you know, 
four five hundred thousand dollars per building i'm guessing and that's that may be on the low side you know typically i'm you know seeing 175 to 200 dollars a square foot um so you know it takes a while to recoup that capital investment so um you know he he's got the uh he's got a uh, financial um, incentive to keep them up um one thing i will say just on a personal note and um, Josh is a builder. Um, I live out in St. Martin's, and uh, Josh has built, what, four houses? Yeah. Four houses right next to me. Um, you know, and, you know, we're out in the, uh, um, just outside, or just inside the St. Martin city limits, and, you know, we're looking at 2,500, 3,000 square foot houses, and he, he builds a very quality product, so. Um, and, you know, I will say that as far as there was a comment about why here, um, Josh has been working with us for several months, and this is probably about the fourth location maybe that he's come to us with. And um, really this is, I mean, with the, the grading that's done, the size of the lots, um, you know, to me this is really kind of a slam dunk. Uh, one more thing, and I hate to just keep on going on, on here, but I keep thinking of things that were brought up. Um, as far as that last lot, um, there was some concern about how close it is to the creek. Um, that lot is actually 175 feet wide at the street. So um, while the 50-foot buffer, um, they are correct that it does basically go to where the center of that existing culvert is, um, there's more than adequate space, and we've got the – where we've – where we're situating the the building is shown on the drawing there um you know we've got it pushed to the north as as far as we possibly can so um, there will be plenty of uh in a practical standpoint that 50 foot buffer that they've um that we've put in on that south property line from a practical standpoint is probably really going to be quite a bit more than that so driveway over the at hole you know i I wouldn't swear one way or the other, but um, that's not really a big deal. We, you know, it may have to get adjusted to, to be in the in the driveway, but that's a pretty routine uh, situation. I just want to add one comment. I, I support the affordable housing, and I for, uh, support the ideal of bringing these to this area. I'm just concerned about the flooding. Uh, it wouldn't do you any good, and it wouldn't do the neighborhood any good if they're going to crumble. No, and, and, and I agree with you. And, and uh, so the, where all the stormwater goes in this situation is there's a creek slash ditch along the east side of Del Cerro that turns into a box culvert right here, and then it's enclosed all the way through del cerro and goes all the way true through uh, to el sorry thank you um to the other side of uh, east elm street so there is a um, open channel that runs along the east side of that um you know we've that name that's a city infrastructure um so i don't know and as i said the stormwater pipe that crosses um el dorado needs some maintenance and the city's been made aware of that um the elevations of the units obviously josh doesn't want his duplexes to get flooded so um we've situated those uh the elevations of those units to where they'd be um you know at least a foot if not two feet above the actual street level which is you know significantly higher than the creek on the on the other side of the road so Yes. Does anybody have any questions for Paul? Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you want to come up. Okay, I took some notes, so hopefully I'll touch on everything people brought up. Um, but yeah, as far as well, he kind of made that point, but letting them go and becoming slums, that wouldn't benefit us. That would really hurt us to do that. So um, we obviously plan on keeping these up and as nice as we possibly can. Um, 
to get a quality, you know, renter to stay in there. Um, and I would think a quality renter um, that pays that likely isn't involved in a lot of crime, if any crime, I'd hope. Um, and then the resale value. Um, I would think the government buildings or um, a commercial building there would probably hurt their resale more than quality duplexes. Um, oh, I'm going to move for that, and I didn't know what you were talking about. Oh, yeah. I, excuse me. <laughs> I made the calls before we really got involved about the land because it goes into straight rock where you hit those trees straight up, and the rest is flat. And Tweehouse House chipped all that out, so it's, it feels marshy to them because there's only about – a foot and a half of topsoil in the whole thing, and then it's solid rock. So we have to dig down for footings to hit solid rock or hit solid ground no matter what. So it's just because that water is in there. I think once we get everything addressed, it'll this isn't going to be an issue yeah. at all. Super flat. Yeah, well, it's flat, flat, flat. We don't have to get into that hill whatsoever. Right. So. And then um, the lighting issue. Uh, we are only going to do what is required because also, I mean, to thank the people that live there, they're not going to want lights in their own you know so whatever is required um is what we'll do and nothing beyond that i don't want and, spotlights everywhere <laughs> and there's fire hydrants going in they have it's required so. oh yeah that too so there'll be fire hydrants um, all the way down yeah and then um someone asked about fencing uh because we we're allowing small pets and absolutely be for so many reasons um i want my people that live in a duplex together to get along and not have any issues with each other and if they both have pets Fencing will fix a lot that could come up there. So um, I think that's kind of about it. Yeah, and then worried about a ton of people and all this parking. But, I mean, when they're two-bedroom, there just can't be a large number of people in them. So I don't think we're going to be seeing an issue with that either. Um, see, yeah, anything Paul, else? Mm -hmm. I think Paul addressed everything. Yeah, he did. He kind of took care of a lot. And like some of the stuff got on here twice because I was just noting yeah. as people were mentioning. But there should be plenty of parking for at least four vehicles, excluding the garage at every. At yeah, every side, so. and also, and I mean, on street parking. I mean, I have friends of all walks of life, and even in the most high end neighborhoods, like v very nice. Um, when they have a Christmas party, we park on their road, and it's you know not an issue, even in million dollar neighborhoods. So I. I don't know, you know, that it would be an issue in this situation for rare occasions. Is that all? Yeah, okay, thank well, you. Well, thank you. Uh, real quick. Yeah. Um, I think I'll bring up my comments real quick. Just, yeah. um, you know, and I understand the neighborhood's concern as mm -hmm. far as they're, they're definitely, they're concerned. I can definitely understand that. Um, I will, I do want to say a few things um, that, Probably the best case scenario would be if the, you built homes there, right? Um, expensive homes, I guess, or yeah, or, no, or not or nothing at all. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, and I think that's I feel the like feel I get. We've had a lot of that lately. That yeah. people were always like, "Not in my backyard." Yeah. Yeah. They want it to stay empty, I think it would and be I can understand that. But I also <laughs> think that that land has been there for a long time, and I feel like something's going to go there somewhere or another. And I do feel like this is a good option. And also the fact that it is high-end uh, rentals, does it, because it's a rental, doesn't also mean that it, a lot of people transition. Uh, so there's people that come here to town that need a place to live because they either sold their home and they're wanting to move here. Mm -hmm. So even though it is on the high end, yeah, that's high. But there are people that will pay it. There's people that oh, will yeah. pay a lot more yeah. because they need a place to live. So I do feel that, I mean, I still feel like it's a good, um, uh, use of the land in that in that uh, yeah. scenario mm -hmm. anyways um, and our number for rentals is based off of uh, our realtor has already a list of people looking for stuff a lot of older people that are wanting to get out of homes and they don't have to do anything they right? don't want maintenance grass. but they want to still feel yeah. like they're so, in a neighborhood a, well you know, and, and building costs too I know that yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing too about pets you know, you do allow pets? Small ones. Would we th under 30 pounds? Yeah, okay. We have it written down somewhere. Right. Something small, because in my mind, when we were coming up with that rule, the person I think that's going to be most inter interested in these are is, it's going to be somebody retired that wants no maintenance, and they probably have a little companion pet. And I think a lot of people have pets nowadays, so yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm glad to see that you're at least allowing that. Uh, yeah, because almost no rentals do. That's what so many people... Um, uh, Thank you, Hank. 
and I'm, I'm gonna try to keep it short. I know every, you know everybody's it's been a long night, but I just want to make it, you know some comments that um, I think the last one would be that. Um, actually, I think that was pretty much it. So, anyways, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for them or any comments for them? One quick one: yeah. Have you purchased this property? Oh, we are under contract to purchase. Depending on how these meetings go. Yes. That's <laughs> why I asked. Yeah. So, yeah, we have money down, but we don't own it yet. Yeah. Okay. Question. Um, it's going to vary. We're going to build. How long is it? Anyone's going to take to build? Yeah, really uh, so, as a whole, yeah. we're going to probably build a couple at a time. So, we're probably going to do two at a time, get them done under roof, get those rented out, and, and then, then kind of keep that going. Just because I don't have the capital to do uh, all eight at once. So, <laughs> so that's kind of the bank's motto is we're going to get them under roof, rent them, proof concept, and then keep going. We, <laughs> we're going to let, if you guys want to talk after the meeting, we'll let you guys do that. I know that I'm not trying to like... Yeah. I just, we, you know. I can address that. Yeah, yeah. if you want Each unit will have their own driveway. Yeah, and then we're going to. We'll have a barrier between the driveway so they To also separate. eliminate like any issues if you're parking on my side or, or who or knows what. Right. Yeah. Okay. So. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Appreciate okay. it. Okay. Okay. Um, we. Sorry, I lost my place. There's so much writing on here. Does anybody have any other. Uh, yes, staff report. <laughs> yeah. We will now close testimony and we'll move to. The staff report. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So, with respect to analyzation of both the preliminary PUD plan and the preliminary and final subdivision plat, uh, it was analyzed with respect to the subdivision code, zoning code, and other uh, code regulations and requirements as outlined in the city code. Just going to briefly touch on a few things. The subdivision name, Dogwood Park Subdivision, was looked into to see if it duplicated any other names. It does. It does not appear to do so. Within any of, does not appear to duplicate any names that are in the city limits. Acreage and lot size was looked into. The buffer yard, so the length or the width, sorry, of the buffer yard was looked into, in its respective locations. Sidewalk, the proposed sidewalk was looked into. Setbacks. The proposal does appear to follow the, the setbacks for the RD district, so a 25-foot front, 10-foot side, and 25 feet rear setback. Fire hydrants, they are shown in accordance with the required 600 feet spacing. Lighting, lighting is shown in, in accordance with the minimum 300 feet spacing. And they are, as a part of the preliminary PUD plan, they are requesting a an RD, residential duplex, underlying zoning district for the purposes of of, or of regulating permitted things such as permitted uses, landscaping, and lighting. And uh, the utilities, I will pass this over to Mr. Wade, though, to finish up with. Well, first, let me go into. Um, where's the clip? Um, I'll first go into just real quick, briefly, before passing this over to Mr. Wade. There is a single motion that is before you all, which would recommend approval. Because the motions have to be positive, it is a a motion that would recommend approval of both the preliminary PUD plan and the preliminary final subdivision plat as they are interrelated in their in, in the proposal in the matters of the proposal. S and with that, I will pass it over to Mr. Wade for his for the engineering division report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Courtney, uh, as far as the infrastructure, I'll try to be uh, brief but thorough as far as our uh, review. Uh, public infrastructure, including stormwater facilities and sanitary sewer facilities, are existing in the vicinity. Uh, El Dorado Drive is an existing through roadway from Bald Hill Road uh, to East Elm Street. Uh, new, I new driveways from each of the duplexes will be accessed from El Dorado Drive for the proposed duplexes. Uh, parking, as uh, the consultant had indicated, uh, we're going to recommend that the uh, removal of the parking, prohib prohibition of parking on the east side of El Dorado, uh, directly across from, uh, not in the Del Cerro portion of El Dorado Drive, but directly across on the southern portion of this development, 
be prohibited uh, to, to all the way to Elm Street, essentially, uh, in order to provide adequate space for parking on one side, on that be on the west side, and then still have adequate space on the roadway. It's 33 feet back to back, and uh, 28 feet is the uh, minimum to be allowed for parking on one side. <clears throat> as far as uh, stormwater uh, goes, uh, stormwater will be uh, directed to El Dorado Drive. <clears throat> Uh, stormwater detention was not initially considered for the Elm Street development, uh, the office type development there. Uh, it was uh, included in in uh, portions of the Del Cerro uh, development and as uh, indicated, we will take a definite closer look at that culvert that uh, goes underneath El Dorado Drive uh, in order to make sure that it's functioning properly. Um, it, uh, from all indications, does drain that uh, drainage draw to the west, southwest, and then uh, empties over onto the uh, drainage channel that's on the east side that runs to the box culvert along El Dorado Drive to the north. <coughs> um, stormwater quality treatment um, was asked to be taken a look at, and as far as that goes, um, the buffer area will uh, serve as a uh, do not disturb type uh, uh, area that would intercept a lot of the drainage and direct it either uh, to that culvert that we spoke of or also to, uh, to slow the water down coming on site from the neighboring areas uh, in order to uh, hopefully uh, collect it and drainage uh, go through between each of the, the uh, duplex units. As far as sanitary sewer goes, uh, there is an existing main that runs along the west side of El Dorado Drive. Sidewalk is proposed along El Dorado Drive along the frontage of this development. Uh, that would be a five foot wide green uh, sidewalk with a three foot green space between the curb and the sidewalk. <coughs> uh, utilities is, uh, have been looked at fire hydrants, street lights, and other utilities. Uh, water lines, including fire hydrants, um, have been proposed uh, at the spacing of uh, every um, per city code. The st uh, uh, street lights that are being proposed, the first one is actually being located, shown to be located on the north side of that first lot eight, which is, um, approximately 300 feet from the, the existing residential streetlight at the intersection of Del Cerro and El Dorado Drive. Um, those streetlights that it would be proposed would actually uh, need to conform to a residential style uh, streetlight standard. And so um, currently there's, other than what's on the parking lots, the uh, state parking lots, there's no lighting that's through that entire area, so for safety and for conforming with the subdivision code, those would be needed. <clears throat> it would be expected as far as traffic goes that the vehicles traveling to and from these duplexes would be to the equivalent of approximately eight single family home homes, approximately 10 trips for each duplex per day. That's not an hourly rate, but that's a daily rate, so that kind of gives you an idea of the expected vehicles that would be generated by this development. <clears throat> I believe all the comments that we have had uh, and asked the consultant to take a look at have been addressed on the uh, subdivision plat and preliminary PUD plan. We will definitely take a look at that culvert and also probably go ahead and investigate that detention basin as well as the box culvert to the north to make sure that everything is properly functioning um, in order to make sure that things are working as necessary to make sure there's no uh, issues as far as uh, flooding because of uh, infrastructure problems. Uh, the review status, um, as far as these uh, documents go, we 
uh, have looked at those. They have been uh, revised and are in good order. And the engineering staff would recommend approval of uh, both all, th all the, the items, uh, preliminary plat, final plat, and the p preliminary PUD plan. I can certainly ask, answer any questions if anyone has any. Any questions for staff? Because the comments have been taken care of, you don't need to make it subject to the condition. Is that my we understanding? We still may have some minor technical comments, okay. but at this point, the majority of everything has been addressed. I walked El Dorado about two weeks ago, so I know there's no pedestrian traffic going up that hill. It is steep. <laughs> El Dorado is extremely steep. You know, not a lot of pedestrian traffic going up there. Uh, it, so we're um, going to. Uh, move on to, uh, is anybody have any questions for staff? No. Okay, we're going to move on to a motion. Would someone like to make a motion? I make a motion to recommend approval of the preliminary PUD plan and preliminary and final subdivision plan of Dogwood Park subdivision with the following conditions. Can you bring your microphone on? Yeah, you know. Sorry. I'd like to turn my microphone yeah. first. Um, I would like to make the motion to recommend approval of the preliminary PUD plan and preliminary and final subdivision plan of Dogwood Park subdivision with the following condition address technical staff comments of city staff. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. Okay. Motion carries. So the just so you know this will go on to City Council, uh, this is a motion of uh, recommendation, so it's not final. It still goes on to City Council for this date. Did I take uh, Courtney's line? Okay, that's it. Moving on to the next case. Um, do you need to take a break? Oh, okay. Thank you for coming. Moving on to next case. Uh, P230112900 block of Route CC. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> I let, I'll let people clear out here real quick. Would it be um, possible to have like a five minute recess? Sure, we can have a break. We'll do a, we'll do a quick break. So we'll do three minutes per Hank.
Okay, I'm going to give everybody a 20 second. Yeah, sorry, I finished that. I was calling Danny. Yeah, no, that's him. Yeah, I mean, I know him really well. I'll even send him a picture right now. Because I do know him very well. Okay. Okay. We're going to go ahead and start the meeting back up. So we're on the 2900 block of Route CC, and we're going to start with um, Courtney presenting the case. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This property is located at the 2900 block of Route CC. It's currently zoned RU rule. And in 2008, it was annexed in, and that's when it, it gained that RU designation. It is currently undeveloped, so surrounding zoning includes to the north is C2 and RS2 with a landscaping business and single family homes located in to the adjacent north. To the east is zoned RU and RS2 with there being Highway 179 being that prominent feature to the east. To the south is unincorporated, but they have single family or low density residential uses there. To the west is also incorporated and they have low density residential uses in that adjacent uh, area as well. So what they're proposing well, first, um, the property again is highlighted in blue, but here's a closer up image of that property highlighted again in blue. It consists of about two, 22 and a half acres, and what they're wanting to do is rezone from RU rule to RS2, the single family residential zoning designation. In addition, they are proposing a 26 lot preliminary subdivision plat, and here is a that plat. And again, they're wanting to do, well, first, the name would be Edwards Ridge Subdivision. They're proposing one street to be named Bobby Court, which would come off of Route CC and head eastward. And they are proposing a, a cul-de-sac length that is roughly about 1,000 feet. And in the code, it, it specifies a maximum of 800, so they're going above that. And so they would need a variance in order to to be able to have that length. And so that is another item that you all would consider. So there are actually three items that are before you all. One is a rezoning from RU rule to RSU loads in city residential, which would you all would recommend approval up to the city council. In addition, there is a preliminary subdivision plat that you all would vote on and approve or decide upon. And then also would be ad added to this, and you'll see it in the forum motion as well and in the staff report. There is a third motion for that variance to a variance from the required or the maximum 800 feet length for cul-de-sacs to which would give them that 200 feet variance so that they can have that thousand feet cul-de-sac and for the rezoning the applicant has supplied res responses to the review criteria in there in the application materials that is also in your packets and the staff has also provided responses to the review criteria in the staff report so I'll just go over a few details about the the plat itself Again, there are there's a new street proposed. There are 26 lots, which vary in, in size from 3.0.38 acres, which is roughly uh, 16 16,000 and a half square feet, and then the largest would be lot 15 at 3.55 acres, which is approximately 154,655 or 38 feet square feet, and so in the RS2 district. Uh, they do have, it does not have a maximum, or sorry, it does not have a maximum area ratio or floor area ratio, uh, but it does have a 10,000 feet minimum net lot area, and all, that is also for the minimum lot area per dwelling. So that's just something to consider. Uh, they are going above that at the, the smallest lot, again, being approximately 6, 16,500 square feet. Another element would be that they are proposing a sidewalk for the south to line the southern portion of Bobby's Court, so to run on the south end of Bobby's Court. 
and no parking would be allowed on the north side of Bobby's Court. And for utilities, so there are a couple of spots where there are fire hydrants, one being located near Lot 26, which is along Bobby's, well, it's at the corner of Route CC and Bobby's Court on the south side, and then towards the middle, still on the south side, there's a fire hydrant shown at Lot 21 and 22, and then at the end of the cul-de-sac near Lots 15 and 14. And so that is the initial information on this request. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you all may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Courtney. Uh, do any commissioners have any questions for Courtney? Mr. Chair, I'd like to touch on the variance sure. uh, situation because it's kind of an odd one. Um, and so uh, usually, usually variances are held by the Board of Adjustment, your, your you know, kind of companion uh, board um, that has their meetings at 730 in the morning um, on, on Tuesdays, if anyone's interested. Um, I wish it was at so, the Board of Adjustments right now. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but, and so, but in, in the subdivision code, uh, there's, there's this requirement. It's, it's something that kind of forces connectivity within, you know, for, for the street systems within subdivisions and calls out a maximum cul-de-sac length of, of 800 feet. And so anything longer than that, you have to have some sort of connection. Okay. Um, it is a fairly common, uh, well, first, the Planning and Zoning Commission is the body that would issue a variance from that requirement within the subdivision code. It actually spells that out within the subdivision code. Um, so you are a body for variances from subdivision regulations, uh, at least that one. Um, but then also, I'll say that it's a very common variance. Uh, unfortunately, the topography of our community and uh, and such uh, necessitates you know a deviation from that from that standard quite often. Um, and in in this particular case, not only the topography but the presence of a you know state four lane state highway you know, kind of you know boxes the property in. There's really not a connection possibility. And so, just wanted to to describe that a little bit that. Uh, that that's the requirement you have the authority to issue the variance and there's a reason there's a reason why and so since it does come up quite often should it be something that we should change and so to do that would then remove some of the powers of the planning and zoning commission to force that street connectivity in situations where it does make sense and so yeah it certainly you know could be a, a topic of discussion but I'd be a little cautious on that any any commissioners have any questions for staff? No? Okay. We will now hear from persons who would like to present this case. Paul, welcome back. Thank you. He's, like, he's still here. He didn't go away. I told Dave I should have packed a lunch. Yeah, I like the strategy. You just wait until we get all beat up up here. And then. That's right. <laughs> uh, Paul Sampson, 2500 East McCarty Street, CMPS, um, representing in this case uh, Mr. Dave Burks, who is patiently waited in the audience with us. Um, Mr. Burks recently uh, purchased this property and is uh, proposing to build uh, upper end single family uh, custom homes. Uh, Dave's been building homes in Jefferson City for, I won't say how many years, but a long time. Um, and uh, really builds a, a quality product um, in the clients that he's working with. Um, there is no place to build uh, larger um, upper end single family custom homes. Um, we, those types of subdivisions, we haven't done one for quite some time. We've been doing a lot of uh, you know smaller lot type subdivisions for a you know two thousand ish square foot house. Um, we haven't done one for for larger homes for for quite some time. So. Um, what the uh, proposed lot layout is, um, if you look along Route CC, there are uh, three lots that front lot Route CC. Um, thank you. Uh, primarily, just because of the topography, there's really no, uh, really the best part of that ground is the, the ground right along Route CC. Um, so we'll have the three homes that are uh, directly connected to that. And then on, along the south side of the property, there's a, a nice ridge that uh, I got to blow up I think here yep so there's a nice ridge that runs right along here so we'll basically build the road right at the top of the ridge um, walk out or side walk out basements on on each side of it and then it'll terminate down here at the end right before we get to 
the creek that runs parallel with uh, Highway 179, which is just up here. Um, so the lot layout generally is everything, everything is based on a 100 foot wide um, lot frontage. Uh, like I said, typically the some of the more recent subdivisions we've done are, have been more in the 80 foot range. Um, so you know this would be more akin to uh, you know a little bit bigger than diamonds lots. Um, um, those kind of that that general size. Um, we've uh, we have been in discussions with the highway department so um, we've been working with them on the location of uh, the street intersection and we've gotten their approval for that that it meets all the minimum site distance requirements the three lots that will front on route cc uh, you know they'll be subject to uh, permitting so there's potential depending on where site distance is available there may be a you know shared driveway between one or, or multiple lots in there um, as far as the uh, utility infrastructure goes we're in uh, water district number two territory and they've got a existing main that runs along the um, west side of route cc and then there's also existing water mains in the subdivision here to the to the southeast um, our project will um, take this water line and uh, connect to the route CC section and run down here to the end of uh, um, to the end of the cul-de-sac um, and we've talked to the water district and their engineers tell us that uh, um, the existing water main along route CC will be sufficient to uh, um, handle the demand for this subdivision um, and if something comes up we do have the ability to to tie on to an existing main that's um, just off to the to the east uh, there is one reserve tract uh, let's go back one um, and it is three acres uh, located here and really that is this property is actually part of the uh, lesh farm that prior to 179 being constructed was probably in the neighborhood of 100-ish acres, and 179 came through and basically quartered it. So there's actually remnants of that farm on all four quadrants of the Route C-179 interchange. Um, so this is just kind of a remnant piece left over between the subdivision down here and Highway 179 and is really not developable in, in any way. So it, we've called that out as reserve tract and in order to comply with the stormwater quality regulations there'll be some sort of a little detention stormwater quality pond um, here on the the downhill end of the cul-de-sac and um, so that's kind of what the the use of that uh, reserve tract will be the house to the north that's Kane's house uh, Andy and Sarah Kane I believe I right? think that is right and it's yes yeah okay I just want well, I, I thought that was it. I just couldn't quite tell yep. on that map. So, yeah. Um, you know, other infrastructure type things. Uh, the existing sanitary sewer is located down here. So we'll have to uh, build sewer main across to uh, get up to the property. And then we'll um, bring it up to serve the, the new lots. Um, the three lots along um, Route CC will be served. And then there'll be an easement uh, from this location going kind of back up that draw along the west side of 179 up towards Green Horizons um, if they chose to extend the sewer beyond that. Um, you know, everything else, electric telephone uh, will all be underground, uh, street lights provided, fire hydrants, all the typical uh, subdivision items. So uh, any questions? Any questions for Paul? And maybe I'll just touch on the zoning piece of it just briefly. Um, so as Courtney said, the this is basically the southwest corner of the city, so we're unincorporated around the east and or around the west and south sides. Um, we did do the uh, commercial rezoning for the Green Horizons area. 
Um, and then we've got the uh, Kane property here that's uh, single family residential. So this would just kind of be a continuation of that and really go along with, even though this is all unincorporated, it's kind of the same style residential development that meets that RS2 zoning. So. And Kane's was commercial. And then I think that's right. During the other, yeah. I do remember something about that, yep. So. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Is there anyone else uh, here who would like to um, present this case? No? Okay. Is there anyone in the audience that's uh, present who would like to speak in favor of this request? No? <laughs> Is there anyone present who would like to speak in opposition of this request? Okay. If you would, come up to the microphone and... Did you did you say you want to speak in opposition? Yeah, come on up. Give us your name and address, please. My name's Deanna Welch. I wish I had this gentleman on my card. <laughs> and uh, what else do you want to know? Oh, just your opposition. Oh, okay. oh, address. Sorry, name and address. Well, I have two residents on Route CC two nine one six and two nine one two, and this I don't know if you all have you seen this particular yeah it's in our package sketch. I believe okay. it's in our package yes. all right what the deal is is this here is CC highway and we just talked about Rock Ridge the Rock Ridge goes across C and then it turns into CC so it's actually old highway C that goes all the way from Russellville to and they renamed it Rock Ridge and then they renamed CC instead of the OC Highway. So it actually goes all the way from Russellville all the way through CC to 54. And it used to be old Highway 54 is what it was. And so anyway, what, he's, what they're what proposing is to put a street and put houses on both sides of this single street that comes out on CC Highway and and they'll be and this here comes out all of these houses will be coming out on C C it's a instead of being width wise like these three are going to be they're going to be they're going to be like regular houses that that are out there now they'll be built with wise and they'll come out on C. But all of these are going to be the long way. And so actually, if, you just, if you're standing on CC and you just take your hand, that's what they're going to, they're going to go all the way back. Are, are you saying that you're concerned with uh, driveways coming out onto, is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm concerned about is the whole subdivision. That's going to be like, uh, I think 24 houses just stack on top of each other and then there's a color sec and they'll turn around and come back on this side with houses mm -hmm. and this is all residential I mean the, he mentioned uh, the nursery it's way down on the corner and it sits right you there's no issue all the rest of it is residential all the way up and down and you can talk to I mean I'm I'm not going to try to pad anything I'm just simply telling you the the problem is the traffic is so dangerous out there right now and and we you can talk to the sheriff's department I mean uh, we've had so many issues with and somebody's gonna get killed is, is the bottom line they just cannot handle that kind of traffic and they go through there so fast and all the way from Russellville to 54 is just, and that's why I really hated to see um, the Dollar General go in there because it's just right across the road. Has it, gone, has it gone on yet? Hasn't gone in yet. There's still another meeting to go. But anyway, go. okay, so what I'm saying is I just feel sad that, that someone would do uh, something like this the long way with so many homes. I mean, it's just sad. And, and, uh, we're, we're at, we're at three minutes. Just so. 
I think she's con the traffic. She's concerned about no, see, adding. All of these houses will have to come to the same point. They'll have to come out on CC. And all of these, it, it, it's a row of houses, and then it's a narrow street and a row of houses, and they all come out of this one entrance onto CC. And um, I mean, I, I really am not prepared to even be up here because I um, didn't lo learn about it until like Sunday. But, um, and I apologize for not being more prepared. I didn't realize you all would yeah, vote on it tonight, to be honest with you. I know, but, but you make a difference. I mean, I feel like you make a big difference. Well, thank you. Finally. <laughs> well, we thank you for coming up and uh, voicing your opinion. Okay, thank you. And then. Uh, I'm uh, Lee Offenberger. I'm, I live at 3009 uh, CC. Um, I like these devices. Let's see, my house is right there. Okay, and what Leona's saying is this: this easement's going to come out right here, and there's this there's this curve of the road here, and I understand that by by. Uh, by standards, that's that's an acceptable place for an easement, but that that road, this I like this thing, all right, this curve here has a slight rise to it, and traffic typically goes through there at uh, 50, 60 miles an hour or more. Um, it seems that. Uh, a lot of people like to use that as an expressway from Highway 54 to Route C. Um, it's like they don't know the 179 extension is in there. Um, I've had I've had a vehicle uh, coming south down CC uh, at at least 70 miles an hour, lose control, slide into my neighbor to the north property and across my property, and. Uh, uh, came to a stop pinballing off of four of my trees. Had those trees not been there, my neighbor to the south would have been hit. Um, I'd, I'm here just to go on. I, I just, I just want to make the comment that this this area is very dangerous. There's um, there are large uh, concrete trucks that go through there at least 60 miles an hour. I figure they're 14 tons. Uh, if they're if they're traveling from the south back up through there, they're not going to be used to having an easement coming out over that rise. Um, um, my concern is uh, uh, the potential for an accident coming out of that easement. Um, that's all I have to say. If you have any questions, yeah. Um. I completely understand what you're saying because my parents have the same situation. They they have a, a tight corner and and people end up in their yard. So what they did is they put these huge boulders out in their front yard. You should see to the, keep you, them from hitting the house. My house is the one with the three big rocks. In the <laughs> so I, I totally get what you're saying. Um, so and those a, and those trees to the south, uh, right before Foxmoor, they've all been hit by right. vehicles. And, and I will. I mean, I'd like to comp point out too. You know, not everybody in that subdivision will come out at one time. Correct. You know, and I, I don't think that this subdivision. And I'm not no traffic specialist, but I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue as far as traffic goes. But I do understand you, something new. People don't know about it, um, and I've been on that road many times, and it is it's pretty narrow. But I'm, as far as people driving down it, you know, it's the developer's not going to have much to do it. Uh, with that part of it but um as far as adding more traffic to it i, I understand instead of instead of fear mongering now I, I was in the military for 33 years i was learned don't complain if you don't have a solution yeah. okay i know I'm, I'm sure this easement's going to be pretty <laughs> wide but if 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 the easement would start to spread out deeper into the property to where there's more of a an ex, a runoff for vehicles to accelerate to get out there on the road, I think that'd make a big difference. Yeah. 
Um, I think I think a normal easement there where vehicles like to uh, test their traction control. Um, and, and I also too think you know once homes do go in there, there will be quite a bit more visibility. You know, there will be some vegetation removed, and you will be able to probably see uh, people pulling out will be able to see further down the road. I'm I'm assuming, but so. Well, anyway. thank you all for yeah. your time. I just want to go on record that there are what I feel legitimate concerns. Thank you. Are. Does anyone have any questions for Lee? Uh, so, where Foxmore comes up to CC, are, do traffic crashes occur there? They don't, but there's um, um, the the actual rate of the turns are really loose. I mean, you can it's almost like driving straight through there, but through this through this turn. Right here, there's a rise. Okay, there's a rise, and and again, someone coming out of that easement will be able to see over that rise to the left, see what traffic's coming, come to the right. But if if someone's distracted and they just come out there on the road, there's a good, there's a there's a slight possibility that they could be hit. We've actually, we, sorry. Thank you. I appreciate it. Anybody else have any questions for Lee? No. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to speak in opposition of this request? Okay, seeing none. <clears throat> Is there anyone that would like to just speak on this request? Seeing none, we will now close testimony and we'll go to Courtney with the staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Again, there is the review criteria that was analyzed and the applicant has supplied the responses in their application materials, which is in the case packet. In addition, staff has provided responses in the staff report. And this covers a variety of topics, including the existing zoning and whether it's it was valid at the time of adoption. And then has there been a change of character in the area? Is there a community need for what they're proposing, the single family residential use? Is there a proposed change consistent with the comprehensive plan and it is found to be so and is it also con consistent with the ordinances and regulations in particular those of the city code and then is the proposed zoning compatible with the surrounding zoning and is there are there public and community facilities available to serve the proposal and then also additionally are the what effects will the uses have essentially on the the adjacent properties and then what are the potential environmental impacts of this use uh, is there adequate supply of utilities essentially to to facilitate and, and coordinate the uses that are that the uses that that is proposed and then is there what what extent of benefits will be derived from the proposed use? And so, uh, there um, we're going to go. Into, I'm going to go into also a little bit about the subdivision plat briefly. So the proposed name is again Edwards Ridge Subdivision, and that was checked to see if it duplicated any names. It did not appear to do so. Again, there is a new roadway being proposed, a cul-de-sac, which goes in the length of they're they're wanting to do a thousand feet length which goes beyond the maximum allowed 800 feet so they would need a variance of 200 feet from that requirement looked into acreage and lot sizes and in particular looked into the zoning code article 5 where it goes into lot dimensions dimensional standards looked into the the sidewalk placement parking placement traffic it did not meet the traffic input impact study threshold of 75 so where because it has less than 75 lots it does not require it does not trigger a traffic impact study and looked into placement of fire hydrants other utilities make sure that they're all properly where they need to be if and that they'll be able to to diligently facilitate the use and so the the use itself the single family residential use would be compatible with the existing low density residential use and would be consistent again with the comprehensive plan. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna go into, <coughs> before passing over to Shane. Um, there, are, there are three motions. So one, the first would be the rezoning, which would make, so the first would recommend the, re, uh, 
the proposal for rezoning from RU rule to R2 single family residential. So that again will be a recommendation from you all to the city council. Then the next two would be decided upon by you all, which is the variance of 200 feet from the, the maximum 800 feet to permit the 1,000 foot cul-de-sac that they want for Bobby's Court. And then finally, you all would decide upon the preliminary plat for Edwards Bridge subdivision for those 26 lots, which would comprise of the single family homes. And with that, I'll give it over to Mr. Wade for his engineering division report. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As far as, I'll try to be brief, as far as uh, infrastructure goes, um, as everyone had indicated prior, Bobby Court is accessed from Missouri Route C and will need to be permitted by MoDOT in order to gain access to Route C, as well as the three uh, additional lots that front Route C. CC, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, Route CC, we're not talking about Route C in this one. Um, driveway access um, has been proposed for the corner lots on the corner of Bobby Court and Route CC, uh, and drive access would be from the, the new roadway, not, the, not Route C. Um, and it is a 28-foot roadway with parking allowed on the south side of the road to be prohibited on the north side of the road. Stormwater design, stormwater detention, and stormwater quality is proposed at the eastern portion of the subdivision and is in accordance with our standards. Um, the facility for the detention will be on a separate tract, uh, including an all-weather access road for the city to be able to maintain the facility in the future once it's constructed. The sewer is proposed and is ex proposed to be extended from the southeast of uh, the property in the neighboring subdivision. Um, additional sewer easements have been provided uh, through the subdivision for future access for adjacent properties. <coughs> Sidewalks proposed along the south side of the new roadway. All the utilities, lighting and hydrants, fire hydrants have been proposed in accordance with city standards. Uh, the review status of the plat has been uh, all the items that we have had as far as revisions have been addressed on the plats and the um, plans are in good order and we would recommend approval of the uh, subdivision plats for this project. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Shane and Courtney. Do any uh, commissioners have any questions for staff or Shane or Courtney? None, okay. Seeing none, <clears throat> we're making three motions. Would someone like to make the first motion? I'd like to make a motion to recommend approval to City Council the rezoning of 22.51 acres from RU Rule to RS2 Low Density Single Family Residential. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed nay. Motion carries. Uh, some like to make the second motion. Move to approve um, a 200 foot variance from the maximum cul de sac length of 800 feet to permit a cul de sac length of 1,000 feet. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Motion carries. Would someone like to make the third motion? I'll make a motion to approve the preliminary subdivision plan of Edwards Ridge subdivision with the following conditions address technical comments of city staff. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All, all opposed, nay. Motion carries. <clears throat> the rezoning will go on to the city council with a uh, recommendation for approval from the Planning Zoning Commission. And that will take place. I'll uh, have a public hearing on May 15th. At some point in the future, a final subdivision plat would be presented to the Planning Zoning Commission uh, as a continuation of this project and that's standard. So. Okay. Moving on to the next case, case number P23012, tax amendment to Chapter 3 of Jefferson City Code. Um, this is our guy. Yeah. <clears throat> How's it going, Matt? It's tough being tall. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the case in front of you tonight is a, uh, a council requested change to the temporary signage code for the city of Jefferson. Um, I've got a couple of slides that help summarize rather than the kind of the full text of that, that part of the code. Um, there, are, there are three changes essentially that are, that are being proposed. The first change, um, currently feather flags or advertising flags are prohibited in the city of Jefferson. This change would allow one commercial advertising flag per property, per frontage. So uh, a corner lot would be allowed two flags, one per frontage. Um, it establishes a maximum height for those flags of 12 feet. And this, this change would only take effect in commercial and industrial districts, which I've got listed out on the slide there. But, um, and I'll, I'll stop there. Does anybody have any questions yeah. about the technical side of it? Obviously not allowed okay. right away. Yes, right. yes, they, they would, they're, they're still subject to the, the same rules that any other temporary signs are, not in the right of way. Um, they wouldn't be allowed to be put in the visual clear zones near uh, intersections. Um, and, the, and those kinds of those kinds of rules would still apply. The second amendment is uh, another addition. Currently, commercial yard signs, so um, not the election signs. Those would be non-commercial signs, but that similar style of yard sign for commercial advertising is not allowed at this time. This change to the code would allow one commercial yard sign per business or tenant space. So. On a, on a lot with just one business, they'd be able to put out one sign somewhere having to do with their commercial activity. On a, in a multi-tenant, um, like a strip mall type situation, each business, each business or suite would be allowed one sign. So you could have several on the same lot, but only one per business. Um, it sets the maximum size of those signs at five square feet, which is kind of our standard yard size, maximum size for, for any kind of temporary signage. And again, it only takes effect in the commercial and industrial zones. Um, code does currently allow for one non-commercial sign per frontage. So this would add commercial signage that, that businesses could put out. Whereas the non-commercial, right now the code allows for like election signs yep. or United Way, uh, different uh, school support type signs. Real those those signs? Do what? Real estate signs. Real estate signs, yes. Those and those are allowed specifically. Um, yeah, right. No, we are. Um, but this would allow for a, a, a single commercial sign to be put out for businesses. And then the third change um, in residential zones, specific uses, apartments, churches, schools, cemeteries, and government buildings are allowed to put out. Um, temporary banners or larger signs advertising events and things like that. Uh, this would up that, that maximum size that's currently allowed of 25 square feet up to a 32 square foot. So it's just a small increase in that sign size. Um, it was more or less based around a sheet of plywood size for temporary signs. So those, those are the three changes that this, this, um, this code amendment would impact. This has gone, this was initiated by council. It's been through the Public Works and Planning Committee and approved by them. Um, and so I think what we're, you've got a, there we go. We're looking for a motion to recommend approval to the city council. Is, okay. Understood. No, and you'll notice we we don't have a staff recommendation either way. This is this is a council request to to make a change to the code, and um, well, they already have them too. So I mean, people put them out all the time, whether they're allowed. Or yeah, not. I, yeah, it's ac actually my staff that's responsible for going around and telling them to take yeah, it I'm down. Not so that you don't do that. I'm just saying you see them all the time. You know, yeah, so. it's. Well, I mean, I'd, I'd have to defer to the to the councilman that, that recommended it. Go ahead. There was a couple of city council meetings ago, I think back in December, 
um, there was an owner of a new restaurant. He was coming in, and he wanted to get a, an exception to putting a feather flag in front of his business. And so I probably think that that's where this started. And, and as on the staff side, when we, we do interact, businesses don't know that they're not allowed, even though there aren't many that are usually up around town, and when they are up, they're not up very long. Um, we do run into businesses that have gotten them, and usually one of the requests we hear on the staff side is that, well, what do we got to do so we could put these up? And so this, this falls in line. I'm sure some of those complaints have made it to council wanting to be able to do this. I saw a hand over here. Really quick, so there was a slide that talked about residential, and I think it said apartments and schools and churches. And I just want to make sure when we're talking about residential that we're not talking about in anyone at anyone's home. No. Okay. No. This because there is a, such a thing now, as we all know, as a home-based business. Right. And so I wanted to make sure that we're not talking about people's homes that they're using as a home-based business. No. This. Okay. This part of the code, the only thing we're changing is the size that's allowed. So what, what's allowed currently, those specific okay. uses, because they happen in residential zones, okay. those specific uses are allowed. So schools are allowed to have a banner or a sign up that says, hey, we've got an open house. Okay. And so what's happening with that particular change is we're just increasing that size from 25 square feet to 32 square feet. We're not changing where you can put it. Thank you. No problem. On, on, on these other two, yeah. no, not not in a residential zone. It's it's the allowance is based on the zoning. So if you had a home based business in a residential zone, you this this would not allow commercial signage in that at that home based business. Any more questions? And you're looking for a motion to yes I'll, the motion was up there there you go to recommend approval would someone like to make a or do we have any more discussion sorry hmm. are we going through this like a normal case yes public hearing okay um, <clears throat> um is there anybody else that is presenting this case? I'm assuming not. Okay. Uh, is there anyone here that would like to speak in favor of this request? Is there anyone here that would like to speak in opposition of this request? Is there anyone who would just like to speak on this request? Seeing none, we will now close testimony. Do we have a staff report? On them? Probably not. I, I, I think. It's been presented, uh, as Matt said, no specific staff recommendation. Okay. There's the memo that's included in the packet looking for a recommendation to the city council on this matter. Got it. And nobody else has any questions for staff? Okay. <laughs> Look at Bunny just loving it over there. Uh, the, the lack of recommendation, it, it's it was a direction from council to have something drafted and then our legal staff recommended a path for that that included coming before the the planning because it because it affects land use in in a way of what kind of signage you can put up it was uh, it was our legal department's opinion that it needed to come here for a recommendation alongside the the council process so it's been through public works and planning and approved by that council committee so the text that's in, that's in your packet was what they approved, but before it goes back to the full council, <clears throat> they wanted it to come before this body. So the the lack of a recommendation is it's it's not um, it's not coming from the from directly from like a, a developer or the public. It's coming from council. Any other questions? I think we're good. Um, would someone like to make a motion? 
or no motion at I'll, all. I'll make a motion to recommend approval to the City Council, the Chapter 3 text amendment. I'll second that. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Do a roll call, Mr. Chair. Sure. Quig? No. Cotton? Aye. Fretwell? Aye. Hawk? Aye. Young? Aye. Vote? Aye. Warden House? Aye. And Hoselton? Uh, motion carries. Unfortunately, not another tiebreaker. That's good. Uh, this will move on to City Council, like we said, up here. Um, and then we've yep, introduced on May 1st. Go ahead. Yep, proceed to City Council with a positive recommendation from Planning Zoning Commission. Public hearing uh, scheduled for May 15th, 6 p.m., this chamber. Okay, thank you. Moving on to the last case, P23013, 2700 block of East McCarty Street, final subdivision plat. We'll go to Courtney to present the case. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This property is is located north of the intersection of East McCarty Street and St. Louis Road. It is zoned RA2 high density residential. Surrounding zoning includes R RA2 and RS2 to the north with single family residential uses and yes, single family residential uses and duplexes to the north. To the east is RS2 with single family residential homes located in that area. To the west is zone C2 or CO, commercial office RA2, high density residential and RD, high residential duplex and RS2, with there being multiple, multiple single family residential uses as well as a daycare located there. Or sorry, that is west, I'm sorry. Um, to the south is C2, RS2, C2 general commercial, RS2, single family residential, CO commercial office and M1 light industrial. So that is south with there being multifamily residential commercial office and where wholesale uses there. There's the, the property highlighted in blue again with there being contours, sanitary suit of water lines provided there. And it is, it is 1.10 acres. And what they wanna do is divide that property up into, this is a final plat and they wanna provide, they wanna they're proposing three lots for duplexes is, is the proposed land use. And so you all are the recommending entity on this and then you would pass on a recommendation to city council. Uh, let's see, there are th again three lots proposed with the smallest being lot one at 0 0.20 acres, uh, nearly 9,000 square feet. Lot two is 0.57 acres at a little over 25,000 square feet. And then lot three would be 0.33 acres approximately at around 14,000, nearly, nearly 14,500 square feet. And there, uh, there are no sidewalks. Well, sidewalk does exist along East McCarty Street, and then sidewalk would be required to be constructed along the, f the frontage, the lot that fronts St. Louis Road. And there are no streets proposed traffic there's uh, no traffic impact study required of this and utilities do exist in the area this is the the plat again those three lots with duplexes proposed as a land use and uh, that that is the a, a really short brief overview of, of this request thank you mr chair and i'll add just a little bit to that and so it's not a proposed duplex situation okay the intended construction in the future is duplexes. The property zoned RA2, so we're not deciding on duplexes, okay? They're just very upfront on what they're planning to do there, okay? Should plans change, it's zoned RA2. So it's whatever uses would be permitted in that district, just to make sure that that's clear. Uh, we did do a notification on this subdivision plat. Uh, we, we took the liberty to go ahead and mail out notices uh, to surrounding property owners with 185 feet, a little bit different. Uh, style of notice. Um, you know, I don't want to advance too far down the agenda to that subdivision plat notification procedure, um, but I uh, did feel compelled that we did to tell you that we did mail on this one. Um, 
And so just, yeah, clarifying those two things. Do you, uh, does anybody have any questions for Courtney or Eric or staff? Really quick one, really, yeah. really quick. Can it's you okay. please just take your time? It's fine. Okay, sorry. <laughs> just, just I don't want to hold us up, but could you just please remind me, like, what does trigger a traffic study again? Because I know we had some discussion about traffic yep. issues earlier. One hundred peak hour vehicle trips. Uh, we use the we use engineering manuals to that tell us what the traffic generation would be expected to be in a peak hour situation. Again, we're looking at how many vehicle trips are generated w during rush hour. Okay, so you could potentially have an incredibly large traffic use that's not generating traffic during rush hour and be be kind of off there. But uh, to give you an idea of what triggers that, a typical fast food place uh, will is right on the borderline. Okay, a single family home would be expected to generate one peak hour vehicle trip. Okay, so to give you an idea, to get to 100, you need 100 homes. However, the code requires a traffic impact study for 75 homes or more. So if we have a subdivision plat of 75 lots or more, then that would be a be an item contained in that discussion. Or 50 duplexes or more. And so 50, you know, two unit buildings. And Thank so you. those three things. <clears throat> I'd like to make a quick comment real quick. It's been kind of bugging me too. We uh, this meeting has been really long. I know everybody wants to go home and they're tired and, but we, this is a voluntary position. Everybody here is doing this voluntarily. So if we, we, the public and the people that come in front of us deserve the opportunity to get there, uh, for us to take the time to listen to them. So there should be no rushing through this at all, period. Just want to point that out to everybody. Anyways, on to the the remaining part of the meeting. Uh, well, I'm, cause I hear a lot of shushing over here from somebody, so. I know, Penny, I'm not talking about you. Uh, we will now hear from persons to present this case. Um, please come forward and give your name and, micro, uh, name and address to the microphone. Hello, Paul Sampson, 2500 East McCarty Street. Uh, this case is, as Courtney said, is basically a three lot subdivision. Uh, the owner of the property is Rinkin Jordan LLC, and they actually own several properties in the neighborhood. So they have uh, developed a couple of duplexes here. They've purchased basically this entire property um, recently. Um, just kind of a point of reference, Daisy the Light is right here on the corner. Uh, the same company owns this apartment building here, and then the Rinkin Jordan LLC owns um, the blue area as well as these two uh, duplex or apartment buildings. Um, we recently did a administrative parcel division that split the apartment buildings off from the remainder of the property, so now we are coming here with a subdivision plat that will create oops, wrong direction that will create three lots um, and as Courtney indicated the intent is to uh, develop duplexes on on each of those so very similar to the um, duplexes that are just here off the screen so uh, one duplex would be or one lot is on uh, St. Louis Road and two lots fronting East McCarty Street um, as Courtney indicated, all the infrastructure is in place, basically a, basically an infill development, um, RA2 zoning, so uh, everything fits within that. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Paul? Paul, if it, you mentioned they had a couple other duplexes already. Uh, if, if I'm thinking the right ones, they had been there a while and they had been maintained. Yes. Right. The uh, And actually, I think the duplexes, the, the two there, yeah. um, those were recently, I say recently, I don't know, probably five to 10 years constructed. Time gets away from me sometimes, but yeah, they, uh, they own quite a bit of rental property around town and um, everything they do there is, is, is well maintained, so. They developed off of uh, the, where the condos are above. <clears throat> 
Portobello and yeah. Knob Hill. Yeah. Yes. Kind of the same design. Yep. I just want to add one question for clarification. Is that the break time or? No, that is Daisy Delight. Daisy Delight. Yep. Okay. So that's Thank right you. at the at the wedge of uh, East McCarty Street on the south and St. Louis Road on the north. Yes, so I it's be it. the east side of St. Louis Road. Yep. Does anybody have any questions for Paul? <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else here to present this case? None. Is there anyone who would like to speak in favor of this request? Is there anyone present who would like to speak in opposition of this request? Okay. Is there anyone who else? Uh, is there anyone else who would like to just speak on this request? Seeing none, we will close testimony and Courtney with the staff report. <clears throat> staff analyzed the proposed subdivision or final subdivision plat with respect to again uh, the zoning code subdivision plat or subdivision code various code uh, portion of the code and looked into things such as lot size to see if it would would meet the specifications of uh, for example article 5 of the zoning or yes article 5 of the zoning code which goes into lot dimensional standards and it appears to be so looked into sidewalk construction so again there is sidewalk existing on along east mccarty street and then there would be required construction along the lot that fronts st louis road and there's no streets being constructed again, no Im traffic impact study being required. Utilities exist within the facility. So for the planning division side, the final plat appears to meet all applicable requirements of the city code and staff do recommend approval of this final subdivision plat. There's a single motion which would recommend approval of the final subdivision plat but I will let the engineering division first, if they would wish to make any comments, let them go ahead and do so. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, as far as infrastructure, uh, everything, including street lights, fire hydrants, utilities, sanitary sewer, all seem to be in, in place. Um, we would ask that um, uh, during construction on the units on East McCarty Street, that turnarounds be considered since East McCarty is an arterial roadway and we'd prefer not to have vehicles back out onto the roadway if possible. So other than that, all items have been addressed on the plat and we would recommend approval subject to technical comments. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Shane and Courtney. Uh, do any commissioners have any questions for staff or Shane and Courtney? None. Okay. Would someone like to make a motion? I'd like to make a motion to recommend approval to City Council the final subdivision plan of McCarty View subdivision with the following condition. Address technical comments of city staff. Is there any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. Motion carries. Moving on to We're going to move on to staff updates with Eric Barron. Yeah, staff updates from prior cases. So we have four cases uh, appearing in front of the city council. They've been introduced and are up for public hearing uh, on Monday. And that is the two cases associated with the truck stop out in Algoa, uh, which is a special exception permit for the truck stop and a PUD plan with rezoning for the pylon sign that would represent it and other businesses there. And uh, two other cases, uh, the uh, fourplex for unit residential building on North Timmel Drive and the um, contractor shop uh, for AirServe uh, on Shot Hill Woods Court. Again, uh, Monday, 6 p.m. this room. Thank you. So. And then the next item, uh, I guess I get it to that slide. Uh, yeah. Uh, subdivision plat notification procedures. I think I kind of warned you last month. We're not going to put anything together for you yet. Um, uh, we're going to keep it on the agenda. Um, we have a new director. I'd like to introduce you, Clint Smith, right behind me. Uh, comes from our neighbor to the north, Columbia, uh, who does have a subdivision plat notification procedure. So uh, we've got some insight. Uh, we just haven't had an opportunity to kind of explore it and put something together. And so put it off to next next Darn. next month <laughs> uh, as i mentioned we did did take a liberty to go ahead and notify notifying that one 
And then the other subdivision, the one off of Route CC, has was notified because of a rezoning. And so, um, so you know, we we think they've been been notified fairly well um, to date. So, with that, any questions or comments or concerns? Discussion. Okay. It is these types of meetings that that you really earn your your pay. And right. So <laughs> it. You know, we have a food budget. We rarely get an opportunity to really use it. Um, <coughs> you know, maybe we need to try to get into that. We got away from that from COVID. We like to pair that up with work sessions, um, things like that. Yeah. That's about the about the only you know kind of real appreciation we can send back to you besides our, our words of thank you for your service. This body with this this whole function of development and. and you know, and land use protections within the community would not work without this body and, and without your service. And so thank well, you. Well, like I said, it's voluntary, so we chose to be here. Oh. But <laughs> um, I think we've never had a tie either the whole time I've been here, which I think is crazy because it, I've been here for 13, 14. They are rare, yes. So, and so um, a lot of good discussion as I, well. I would like so. to just say something here in regards to your comments, Dale. I mean, if we're going to have a meeting with this much, you know, feedback from the public, is it not fair to spread it into two meetings? I mean, and we knew that was going to be the case prior to the meeting with the uh, just the letters that we had to deal with. And I do agree that they're entitled to their time, but there's a lot of additions that it's been going on as well. So I just am curious as to if that process could be altered. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, I don't think these meetings happen very often, that the length of this meeting happens very often. I think if it happened more often than, I know that Columbia does more meetings than one per, you know, month because they have a much busier schedule. I, we've never, I don't even know if this is, this is what nine yeah i mean it's very unusual that we're here even this late as a 20-year record i mean it's it's it's, it's, it's definitely the longest i've ever been here mr chairman it was so before 2008 back in those days when we had multiple items before you know oh, the I, great recession before there were anything of this length i i have a question Correct. about kind of along those lines i just have a question um because i serve on the state committee of marital family therapists and so we have meetings like this sometimes where we're going through licensing and but that's very time sensitive so we have to take the meet is this the same type of thing that it's very time sensitive for the individuals that are sure. presenting so that's kind of why we right we have kind of have to do it well, all at I once i agree that the time is necessary but should we break it into two well i mean it seems like And it, it still boggles my mind that it's as busy as it is. Same. I think with construction and interest rates, that things would be much slower. But yeah, it's great. It's good things that are happening. It's great. It's great for Paul Simpson too. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> not really. Mr. Chair. <laughs> oh, sorry. So I served on planning and zoning back in Arnold, and Arnold is half the size population-wise of Jefferson City, they were doing bi-weekly planning and zoning meetings. And what they would do is if there was not a lot on their plate, they would just simply have that slot there dedicated. We're having two this month every you know, other week just in case, but they'll cancel it off if there's nothing to do. But at least we have that time slotted off and we're prepared, hey, if we're busy, we can take care of this and we're not spending five hours at planning and zoning. So, so I will add a little commentary. This is rare. Um, I think it was more common back uh, prior to my time in the early 2000s. Um, there, there was a lot more construction in cases at that time. Um, it can be hard to gauge uh, beforehand. You know, we could have five very quiet cases or we could have two incredibly long ones paired up with something at the end. Um, and so, so it is a bit hard to gauge. Um, also, every meeting, um, you know, every additional meeting would double the staff workload. Um, you know, we can, we can stack cases together in a public, single public notice a lot easier than we can do two notices and two packets and two of everything. And we're pretty stretched thin as it is. And so if there was to be discussion in that category, I think the staffing would have to come up. It probably needs to anyway. 
Um, and so there's there's some commentary. We it's hard to gauge. We have to uh, lay out a, a fairly long timeline, three months, um, you know, before we even start something. The letter that the the neighbor gets in the mail, you know, before any you know, one of the first actions includes a date for the city council meeting. If for any reason this body tables it over, we have to send a new letter. So that's an additional kind of item, and it's okay. It's just something that that has to be you know kind of built in and, and considered. Um, and so I'd, I'd say it's rare, um, hard to gauge. Um, you know, we we seem to work pretty good on a monthly timeline. This is just an oddity, um, and we do quite routinely cancel meetings. Um, so far, I think I'm correct in saying we don't have anything filed for next month. Um, that means we'll get something tomorrow. Paul probably <laughs> delivered it before he came here, but <laughs> and so there's that. But I mean, it can certainly, if this became more routine, then yeah, I think it would would be a very valid point of of, of consideration uh, by the body. Um, you know, also I think although it would be incredibly disruptive to applicants, you know, there could be a certain point where you say we're done shove it all the rest to next month or some other special meeting date. Sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I know everybody wants to go, so um, we, we can discuss this at a later date if it becomes a problem. Or, uh, I don't know if I can take we'll, we'll talk to you here in a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, call this meeting adjourned. Thank you.